Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. It's going to be episode number 25. And on today's episode, we are going to be ranking the top 10 power forwards in the NBA. Go over James Harden's comments against Daryl Morey today. That man, it's crazy. Um, and like I promised on last episode, we are going to be covering the NFC East. And I will get riled up as a Cowboys fan one time on the podcast, and then that's it for the rest of the season. <laughs> You're not going to get any type of craziness out of me. Um, and lastly, we're going to finish it up with a little a little tier list of some of the biggest, quote-unquote, MVP snubs of the last 23 years in the NBA. So got a pretty loaded episode. We're going to go ahead and get right into it, as we always do. How are we doing today, Dane? Doing good, man. Recording the pod at night, so I'm a little tired, but you know, I'm still locked in. We still gotta get this content out. So I'm doing good. I'm ready. I'm excited. For sure. The grind with the off the glass podcast is real getting it out the mud each and every day. Um, I'm gonna get the housekeeping out of the way as always. If you are on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, go ahead and leave a five-star rating. Pre-download the show, it helps us out a ton. And we're just going to go ahead and hop right into it because, to be honest with you, power forwards probably is the weakest position group <laughs> that we've ranked so far. For sure. Um, yeah, and definitely with the added context that we're going to be listing AD as a center, um, that takes out one of the probably guaranteed top two or three people in this position. So um, this is probably going to be the only list which includes uh, a second-year player, someone that was a rookie last year, um, I guess we probably both have Paolo on here somewhere again, just because you get up towards nine and 10, you're looking at like Tobias Harris. Right. These guys sting. We're talking about role players. <laughs> it's just slim picking. So um, we're going to go ahead and get right into it here. Starting out at number 10, who do you has, have as your top 10 power forward? Again, going into next season, um, projecting a little bit, who do you have at number 10? Uh, number 10 for me is Aaron Gordon. Um, like you said, once you get into that 9 and 10, bro, it's just it's, it's getting weak at this position. But Aaron Gordon is a solid player, though, obviously coming off a championship, being a, a very key part of the Nuggets championship. So I'm not I'm not going to come out here and make it seem like Aaron Gordon some bum. Like, no, he was a very good contributor for the Nuggets. And going into the next season, I see him having the same exact role, having the same exact impact for a team that can be in this, do the same exact thing. thing. They're still a championship-level team. They're going to be contending. Um, they should be favorites right now. So he's going to have the same impact that he did last year. He's going to have the same exact role. So, yeah, I, I have him at number 10. It's actually good to see him um, come to the Nuggets and make a make a really good impact, kind of like how like Wiggins did when he went to mm -hmm. the Warriors and had an instant impact on a championship-level team. So it's, it's really good to see. So he, he's my number 10. Yeah, I think – I'm glad you mentioned Wiggins because, again, they both are guys who had much bigger roles in their previous team, that being Wiggins in Minnesota. Aaron Gordon, when he was in Orlando, didn't really work in terms of providing wins. Um, and so going to a new location, having their role kind of condensed, um, I think really has done wonders for their career. Obviously, both of them are now NBA champions because of it. Um, Aaron Gordon is number 10 on my list as well. Um, you know, the counting stats, especially in Denver, are never going to, you know, jump off the page to some of the other guys we have on this list. Last season, he put up 16 and six um, with three assists, um, about a block and a half or I'm sorry, about a block and a steal a night. Um, but there's an argument to be made that in terms of you know, impact, obviously, Jokic is their number one guy there, especially in the playoff run. Jamal Murray, in terms of impact, is second. But, like, Aaron Gordon, when you factor in how good of a defender he was for that entire postseason run and on top of the, the people that he had to defend in each series, like Anthony Edwards in the first series, Devin Booker and Katie in the second series, LeBron and AD in the, the Western Conference Finals, and then he goes into the finals against Jimmy having to switch on to Bam at times, like he's taking on the best players each and every night on the defensive side of the ball and making it very difficult for him, like playing top, top quality defense and was a big reason why um, the Nuggets were able to really dominate the entire playoffs the way that they did this year. Um, Aaron Gordon, to me, I think is really like, that is like top end 
role player, like in terms of yeah. not even just output, but I think the fit as well. Like he fits so perfectly alongside Jokic and the rest of that Nuggets team. Like I don't think you could ask for much more out of any role player <laughs> across the league. So um, yeah, I have him at 10 on this list again. It's just like, it's going to be tough because everybody else in front of him is bigger in their roles or younger and kind of growing and developing more, but it's not really a slight on AG because he now is definitely a proven champion. You can never take that away from him and was a really big contributor um, on that team. Yeah, for sure. So my number nine, actually, um, it's kind of interesting. My number nine is actually Draymond Green. Um, and honestly, I'm really not even going to talk a lot about Draymond because everybody – Everybody knows who Draymond Green is. Everybody knows what Draymond Green does. What I do want to bring up, though, because I just put up, you know, his his points from – not his points, his whole just box score and everything from last year just because – I was just curious because, obviously, we already know Draymond Green is not a box score guy. He's not a numbers guy. That's not how his impact is measured through numbers. But it is just so interesting to look back. And I'm just seeing his whole career, mm-hmm. like – like if if someone has never watched Draymond Green play basketball and just looked at his stats, they'll be like, "Bro, how? What are y'all talking about? This guy is a bum. Like <laughs> they would think that this guy sucks. Like, bro, eight and seven, seven and seven, seven and seven, seven yeah. seven and eight. Like these are like pedestrian numbers, but like yeah. it just does not tell nearly the, the story for him like at all. So it's just that part I just think is so so interesting and. I've seen someone say before, it's like, if you really want to test someone's basketball IQ, like, ask them about Draymond Green or what they think about Draymond Green. And that mm-hmm. that's so true, bro, because if you're a box score watcher, it's not going to tell the story at all. So um, yeah. I got him nine just because I think people ahead of him or either, like, some of these guys are all NBA guys. Some of these guys are all stars. Just like, even though I might rather want Draymond on my team, I can't pass. I can't just put him ahead of a guy who's averaging twenty five and ten or something like that, or even um, some of these younger players I have ahead of him because this list is projection. Right. So that's the reason I have Draymond at nine. Yeah, I've got I've got Draymond a good bit higher, but look, the, Charles Barkley called him triple single, and that was really not an exaggeration. <laughs> he do be putting up. I mean, career yeah. averages is eight, seven, and seven. Like this is just is what he is but uh like you said the year in and year out like the he is literally the warriors defense like his on off stats when he's on the floor and not on the floor in golden state like he makes their defense work without him it's not really functioning um Mm -hmm. so you said you you definitely can tell if people are watching and aware um if they um if they're just box for watching based on Draymond's performance on the court because he carries so much of the load defensively for Golden State. Um, my number nine is where I have Paolo, um, who had a fantastic rookie season, like averaging 27 and four as a rookie, or 20.7 rebounds, four assists as a rookie, um, and winning rookie of the year. Like, him and Franz, I think, are probably the best young like front court duo in the league. Um, and in terms of where they're going to continue to grow, like moving into next year, Paolo is going to take, I think, that next leap forward. And like even just watching him in like the FIBA scrimmages, like he's very comfortable handling the ball. He's comfortable at shot creation. He has, I think, an underrated post game. Obviously, we know with the big body, he can finish on the inside. He can be active on the defensive side of the ball. Like he has so much that he already does well. And he's only 20. Like he's only going to continue to get better year in and year out. Um, So I'm excited to see that he's paired up in a, you know, with guys in Orlando who are young, they can grow together and develop together with, um, you know, Jamal Mosley out there. So um, I have Paolo at nine um, pretty much for, for all those reasons. And, you know, if we do this list, you know, a year's time from now, like I could very easily see him jumping into like top five. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's the reason why I put him ahead of Draymond, just because, like you said, this list is projection. This guy averaging twenty points as a rookie is just, like it's insane, bro. So, like obviously, he's only gonna get better from here. Like you said, he's a he's paired with a young Orlando team, so it's just like they're on a good trajectory. And him, um, along with the other young players on his team, like Franz, like they. 
listen, they're they're gonna be Magic is gonna be good. Like in the, in the I say a couple years, like the Magic's gonna be a really good team, and he's gonna mm-hmm. be leading the charge. So that's the only reason I have him ahead of Draymond. Um, so yeah, that's actually so that was my number eight. Um, do you have Draymond at your number eight? No, I have Draymond at seven. That was my number nine. Oh, okay, okay. So who's your eight? Because I I got Paolo at eight. Okay, my number eight is where I have Evan Mobley. Okay. Um, so I I went kind of back and forth between Mobley and Draymond um, for seven and eight, and I kept Draymond in front of him really just, again, like I said, because of how much he still carries defensively for Golden State. Like, it was huge during their, like, championship runs, like, in the mid-2010s, obviously. But still to this day, I think the they finished kind of middle of the pack, like in the 20s or high 20s in terms of defensive rating. With Draymond off the floor, they would have been last in the league. Like, the drop-off from, like I said, from him on the floor and off the floor is night and day in terms of what they can do defensively. Evan Mobley, again, I think is going to – continue to be a perennial all defensive team guy. Um, and I really liked his growth year over year in terms of offense. I think he still needs to get more comfortable shooting, um, which all that stuff will come with time. There's no immediate rush, but the three point percentages should get a little bit of higher. I'm not saying that I need, he needs to turn into like a stretch big, but you know, adding that facet to your game um, will help a ton with the spacing, but just again, unlock more for him offensively. He has good touch around the rim. He uses his length well um, on both sides of the ball, but, again, particularly on defense. He's one of the most switchable bigs um, in the league. Um, and, again, it's a testament to why he was a defensive player of the year finalist in his second season, which is – I don't know how many people have done that. I imagine that's got to be somewhat rare in the NBA. Um, but, again, it speaks to, A, Cleveland as a whole having the best defensive rating last year, but him in particular – Um, being able to play off of Jared Allen, which I think is definitely the way that teams are going to construct their rosters when you have that kind of really tall, lanky guy that's kind of a power forward but is athletic enough to be switchable. If you play him with another big who can bang with their bigger body and kind of like let this guy become a roamer in the way that Evan Mobley can, um, that's when you really unlock their full potential defensively. So um, I'm excited to see how he continues to, to grow offensively like, the defense is already there, and honestly, that's probably going to get better too. Um, so I I went back and forth between the two of them, but to me, Mobley has better defenders around him comparatively to how much Draymond has to do really by himself in Golden State and the on-off Amazing. numbers. Like, again, not, not that defensive rating is the end-all, be-all, but – Cleveland's defensive rating is like one point better when Mobley's off the floor. It doesn't mean their defense is necessarily better, but that's just how the stats break out. Like I said, with Draymond, they go from like 20th to like last in the league with him off the floor. Um, so not defensive rating isn't always the best metric to use, but you know, it can give you some type of insight. But even if you begin like just watching it, like, like I said, with Jared Allen, he has some help there. He has other guys on the wing. There's a lot of bad defense in Golden State mm-hmm. and Draymond – not only like is the anchor there, but is like the quarterback of the defense for them. Um, and that's been well documented year in and year out. So I have Draymond at seven and Evan Mobley at eight. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. That definitely makes sense. I'm about to say, cause I have Evan Mobley at seven. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, again, it really just came down to like the fact that he's so young, like you said, in his second year being like a, a deep boy finalist, it's like, Bro, like you said, the defense can only get better. His offensive game has a lot of room to improve. So, like, as these years go on, like, obviously that's going to get a lot better. His defense is going to get a lot better. But it makes sense what you said, like, when he's off the floor, it's not as as big of a drop-off that as than when Draymond is off the floor. Like, when Draymond's off the floor, the Warriors are, like, <laughs> The terrible. defense is rough, bro. <laughs> it's it's horrible. Like, it's times where he's on the floor and he can't account for everybody. Like, it's, he's on the floor still, and it's just he can't make up for everyone's mistakes. So, yeah, I definitely see the argument for putting him ahead of Evan Mobley. I just think that, um, like, Evan Mobley, he, he's only going to get better. That's really what it is. It's strictly just projection-based for me. So, um, so my number six, my number six is actually Julius Randle. And I'm not the biggest Julius Randle fan, I'll be honest. Like, just I'm not a huge fan of guys that kind of, disappear in the postseason but at the end of the day this guy is 25 and 10 
he's an all NBA caliber player. Like, yeah, he doesn't really show up when in the biggest moments, but just as far as him, even before Brunson being here, uh, being that guy, being that first option, even, I mean, you could say he still was the first option. It's just when he yeah. disappeared a little bit, obviously Brunson had to take over. But a lot of the season, you could say he was the first option. He was the guy that made the all-star team over Brunson. So at the end of the day, he's not a bad player. Um, he can score the basketball. I just think that I don't know if it's the way he plays. Like, I don't know what it is when it comes to postseason time. It's just he's just not that same player. Like, he's just really mm-hmm. not. But, again, you just can't – I can't overlook 25 and 10. I just can't do that. All NBA, all-star, I just can't overlook that. So, for me, he's number six. I've got Julius Randle at six as well. Um and a lot of that does have to go into f- factoring in the the postseason performances. And that goes back to not just last season, like even in the series against um, the Knicks a couple of years ago where Trey Young is out here shushing the arena mm-hmm. in Madison Square Garden. You know, that season he's averaging – let me pull this up. 2021 season, he's averaging 24 a night. And in that series, I think he only had 18 a game. So, like, that's a steep drop-off. Against the Cavs, he was averaging 14 points. Now, he had the injury early on. I know that he was nursing. But even in the Miami series, you know, 18 points a night, 28% from three. He shot 33% from the field in the the opening round series against Cleveland. Like, Brunson was trying his absolute best to get the Knicks – those last two games um, against Miami. Him. Yeah, he was putting up performances that I think are not going to get talked about enough, but they're kind of just going to fall to, you know, time and history because the Knicks ended up losing. But what he did in those last two games, like the amount of minutes he played, he had the what, 41, I think, in the game that they ended up losing. Mm-hmm. Um, and up to that point, he had the, the turnover that basically cost him the game, but I don't know if he had any other turnover. Like was playing almost as perfect a game as you ba- of basketball as you could want. And it's just like he's not getting the help from the actual All-NBA player on the roster. Right. So to me, going into next year, I think that in a lot of people's eyes, the best player on the Knicks is Jalen Brunson and not Julius Randle. Um, at least I, that's how I view it. I've that's seen Knicks fans. That view, I see not even just Knicks fans, but NBA fans as a whole. I, I know Julius Randle has got some bad rapport with Knicks fans as a whole. You know, they taking his sign down outside of MSG <laughs> after the game. But a lot of that has to do and like, I don't want to say that I'm factoring this in because, like, this isn't really basketball related. But still regarding Julius Randle, like, the body language at times, too, is – there's been too many instances over the last couple of years where it's like he's like checked out. He like gets in these arguments with the refs. He seems like he's like disinterested on the bench. And like it's just way too many times where it's like the body language is not it, bro. You do not feel like you're bought into the team. Um, and so all of that combined with like the issues in the playoffs and that you have a guy in Jalen Brunson who in his first season of being – like having that kind of responsibility full time, like stepped up to the plate and went above and beyond, like in the most do or die situation for your season. And you weren't there. And so that to me is why I have him ranked a little bit lower on this list, even though he was an all NBA player this past season. Um, But again, going off of how I would hopefully view the Knicks moving forward would be that they realize that Brunson is the guy and like, things kind of get built out and he has the keys to this offense moving forward. So I think with that in consideration is why I have Julius Randle at six on my list. Okay. Okay. All right. Getting into this top five. <laughs> this is so funny, bro. This power four list is so much different than the other ones, bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much different than the other ones. I feel like centers is going to be a little, it's going to be a drop off bad with the centers too. Yeah. It's going to be like four guys at the top and then like a big drop in terms of like player. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, get into the top five. So my fifth best power forward in the NBA is actually Lloyd marketing. Um, and I was, I don't, it was tough for me, um, putting him ahead of Julius Randall just cause I was thinking like, 
if the only reason I'm knocking Julius Randle is because of lack of playoff, not success as far as winning, but just like how he plays in the playoffs, it is kind of weird to all to put Laurie ahead of him because it's like we haven't even seen him in that position. Yeah. But I the only reason I put him ahead is because I think that going into the season, a lot of people just looked at the Jazz as like this team is gonna tank, this team is gonna suck, like this team is gonna be one of the worst teams in basketball. And yeah, he did have them in a position where they, they came were, out firing at first, they, bro. They started off hot, like yeah. they was, bro. They had didn't they have the number one seed at one For, point? Yeah, like, it was like them and the Spurs was up there in yeah. the Western Conference standing like the first month. Yeah, I know, I know. Listen, they were pissed off. Their ownership was pissed off. Like, bro, we are trying to lose. What are y'all doing? They're out here, him, Jordan Clarkson. They're out here balling. So um, that's really the main reason why I put him ahead, just because he had them in a position that I don't think anyone expected them to be in. Um, even to end the season, like, they – I think they were, like, right outside of the play-in. Like, they weren't one of them bottom teams. So mm-hmm. um, to do that against the expectation, have your career have your career year, like, have your best year of your um, of your career – I, that's the only reason why I put him ahead of Julius Randle. Yeah, I have Lloyd Markin in here too for most of the same reasons. Like you said, like it is a little unfair to be like you have Lori ahead of him because Julius <clears throat> Randle has had so many postseason struggles and like Lori's never made the playoffs. Right. But this is that like him and being in Utah, this is like this is a for real career resurgence. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it just didn't work long term in Chicago. He goes to Cleveland and J.B. Bickerstaff was running that three seven-footer lineup with him, Mobley, and Laurie Morgan is running the yeah. three. And it worked, but it was like – it felt kind of weird niche. And, like, he goes to Utah. He had that – like I said, I've mentioned it a couple times. Like, he played in Eurobasket with the Finnish team, was hooping in Eurobasket, and it's like he never cooled off. He, like, took that right into the NBA season and came out hot. He only put up 25 and a half points a night, almost nine rebounds, two assists – on really good efficiency, like almost literally 49.9% from the field mm-hmm. and 39.1% from three um, and 87% from the free throw line. So like also very, very close to being a 50, 40, 90 player. Um, and this is the first time he's ever been a number one option. Now, granted, it's great to be on a team that is expected to like, you're expected to be the worst team in basketball. So the fact that they even were doing what they were doing early in the year and even still finish with decent, like, hey, what is it? They've had 37 wins, like, more than expected. Right. For this roster, like, definitely, I would say, overperforming what they were expected to. And a lot of that was on Lord Markin's back. And even, like I said, the jump that he made, like, is in Cleveland, he's putting up 15 a night, like, to go up almost 11 points per game um, in one season, like, also winning uh, most improved player. Going into next season, again, like the expectations on the Jazz are not now. Like they're probably going to be another lottery team next year. Um, but he's coming off of an all-star appearance. He's coming off of winning most improved player. Like they have something to build around in Utah with him, which is saying a lot considering the team was kind of just like random thrown together mismatch of – Young players and like vets that have they just Jordan, took whoever right they're like Jordan Clarkson has been there for <laughs> for a long time now and it's just like they don't have like a ton of direction so like him and Walker Kessler now they got Keontae George too it's like okay there's some type of direction here in Utah after you know the Donovan Mitchell Rudy Gobert era so to me it's, it's the efficiency it's being the number one option the, how they overperformed just the general expectation um, and where I think Lori can continue to grow, like being a scorer at all levels. Um, and as he gets better players around him, like who knows, I, I'm just interested to see how he continues this career resurgence, I guess to call it now that he's in Utah. So that's why I have him above Julius Randall. I would never again, like, these are random things to nitpick about. Like if somebody had Julius Randall above Lloyd Markin and like, I'm not going to be like, bro, you're crazy. Like <laughs> I understand either way um, just for the, the sake of this list and like looking forward into next season for both of their careers in terms of where they're trending. I feel like Lori is trending more up. And like I said, with Julius Randall, I feel like people are realizing that Brunson is the best player in New York. And so, 
I don't know where that will go, but that's why I have Lori above Julius Randle. Okay. Definitely makes sense. <clears throat> Definitely makes sense. All right. My number four, my number four is Pascal Siakam. Now, this one was tough, not because, like, I'm just thinking about Pascal Siakam as a player. I don't really know what direction or how to look at it as far as a projection standpoint because I don't know what direction the Raptors are going to be in, and I don't know what direction he's going to be in because I don't even know if he's going to be on the Raptors because he, he's in trade talks. He's been linked with the Hawks. He's been saying, that I'm not going to resign if I get traded to another team. I want to be in Toronto. But then again, it's like Toronto is one of them teams where – they kind of don't really have a clear-cut direction. They're kind of like the Bulls a little bit, where not great, not bad. So it's like you got this all-NBA caliber player. He's a really good player, but I don't really know what direction these guys are going in, so I don't really know how to access it because I don't I don't think Pascal is a one, obviously. I would love to see him on a team where he can kind of be the, section, the second option, not get, like, the full defensive attention. So – yeah, I don't really know what to make of it as far as projections, but I just think four is a good spot because I like the three guys ahead of him. Obviously, number one, we both had to say number one, but the other two guys, I think I'd rather have them on my team than Pascal. Yeah, I I think that sums up pretty much the same thing I would say. I have Pascal at 4-2. Um, I think Pascal has gotten – underrated overall by NBA fans. And I think a lot of that has to do with, like you said, the Raptors being pretty directionless right now. Like I don't know exactly what their plan is moving forward. Um, like you said, he's been in trade rumors for a long time. OG Ananobi has been in trade rumors. Um, and apparently they turned down very large trade offers, like multiple first round picks, three plus first round picks for OG. Um, so I don't know what their plan is long-term. Um, people have gotten concerned a little bit with Scotty Barnes development. I'm not in that camp yet because bro, it's only his second season. Like they like want him to take that crazy jump, <laughs> right? Like bro, you gotta give people opportunities. Like you also got to remember, bro, he's like 20, like this is he's not even 21 yet. I don't think like give people chances to get in and grow. So I think with how the Raptors have been performing, like he's just been flying under the radar, but like, bro, 24, eight and six, those are very hard stats to put up in the NBA. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the number two on their championship team, obviously to Kawhi Leonard. The questions after Kawhi left was, can Pascal Siakam be a number one option <sighs> on a championship team? I don't think so. Um, but like, again, that's not even, it's not even really to be a knock on him because at any given time, there's only a handful of guys who can be number one options yeah, on championship teams. Like, yeah. That's not even a bad, like that bad of a thing. Like yeah. he's still a, a great player. So it's just like, like you said, there's only a couple guys who can be number ones on championship teams. Right. So, yeah, but look, like I said, 24, eight and six. Um, with the length that he brings on the defensive side of the ball. Um, in addition to having like self-creation, he's able to like work out of the post. He can take people off of the dribble. Like he's not just a standstill, catch and shoot, stretch the floor big. Like he can do a lot of things with the ball in his hands as well. Um, I think like he just would be best suited again, paired with another star. Um but, like, I don't know if the Raptors are going to – like, there's no real way for them to do that with how their roster is constructed right now. And their roster is still constructed with a bunch of, like, 6, 8, and up lengthy athletic wings. Like, that is their archetype. They'll find them anywhere. <laughs> um, so, with that, and like you said, the people that I have in front of him are either just, like, some of the best players in the league or are just younger and more potential versatility – um, they're just like really elite on one side of the floor. Like it's having him here behind those guys is less about him and just more about the other people in front of him. Yeah. Uh, but Pascal is definitely, I think, getting underrated. And so I think him being the fourth best power forward in the league is like the people in front of him, I think are pretty, most NBA fans would put in front of him. So I think it's fair, but. He just doesn't get talked about enough for what he does night in and night out for like 
25 points a game is a lot. It's a lie. It doesn't get talked about enough. Right. Yeah. I think that is too, just because, um, I don't know. It just feels like 25 points doesn't hit the same nowadays. Like it's people's minds just because you got people. 40 is the 30. new 30 in the NBA, bro. I swear. We got people averaging 30 and it's like, like it's nothing. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, I just think people don't look at 25 points the same way they did before. And the fact that he's on the Raptors, it's like, He's he's not gonna get talked about uh, as much as he probably should. Cause he, I mean, technically he was a number two on a championship team before. And yeah, that was before he even was really this caliber of player, like all NBA caliber player. So, yeah, he definitely he definitely is going a little bit underrated. Yeah, um, and it has. To, I have to before we get off of it. Like he's one of the players who really like spent so much time in the G League and really worked on his game. Like, bro, his first season in the NBA, he played 55 games, averaged four points. Yeah. A few wow. seasons after that was a 22-point per game – or it was an 17-point per game score and was a number two option on a championship team and now has two All-NBA appearances, I think two All-Stars too, mm-hmm. um, and is, like, consistently going to give you, like, 25 points a night. Like, that kind of development and work ethic is crazy to go from somebody that was so raw to, like, start their career and, like, blossom into the player that he is now. That, I think, also doesn't get talked about enough. It's definitely impressive, 100%. All right, getting into the top three. Um, Number three, I have Jaron Jackson Jr. Now, I think that's to no surprise. I feel Mm -hmm. feel like we probably got the the top three all in the same order. Um, I got Jaron Jackson Jr. Obviously, you know, great defensive player, one defensive player of the year. Um, his de- his defensive impact, I feel like everyone knows it already. Like that's really what he's known for. But I feel like his offensive game has come along a little bit, especially mm-hmm. this past year. Um, especially the times where Ja is out of the lineup, I feel like he is able to step in and really create. Not, I'm not gonna say create like off the dribble or anything, but I feel like he's able to score the basketball better than he had a couple, better than he was able to a couple years ago. Um, and I feel like that can also just improve. That can also get better, especially with these 25 games that Ja is going to be missing. Mm-hmm. I feel like he can step in and then be that guy who can take on some of that scoring load. So I feel like if you pair that and if that gets a little bit better along with his elite defense, I mean, this is – he's bro, he's just a quality power forward. Like, I don't know what more to say. He can stretch the floor. He can score the basketball. He's going to protect the rim. He's going to defend. He can switch out and guard on the perimeter occasionally. Yeah, Jaron Jackson Jr. is is, is a very good player. I got Triple J at 3-2. He averaged three blocks a game last year, and there was a point in the season where I can't remember what team it was. Some random fan on Reddit put out this crazy long conspiracy theory. Like, bro typed out a whole essay (laughs) and was like, I think the Memphis Grizzlies scorekeeper – is adding blocks to Jaron <laughs> Jackson's stat sheet. There's no way he's averaging this many blocks. And dudes went on Twitter and, like, all the games he was talking about and, like, clip for clip on each section of it was like, nah, bro, that was a block. That was a block. That was a block. <laughs> it's like he was blocking so many shots that other team's fans thought that, like, somebody had to be cheating. There's no somebody's way. Somebody's cheating. Somebody want, somebody's cheating for Jaron Jackson Jr. Like, come on, bro. What are we uh, talking about here? But, yeah, the defense is crazy. Like, Three blocks a game on top of a steal a game. Um, the the length at the rim, him, again, another guy benefiting from playing with a bigger body center in Steven Adams who then can just not have to bang with the big that's kind of sitting or playing at the block or getting up in the screen action. Like he can kind of play that help defender role, that roamer, that free safety, and just erase shots at the rim. Um like you mentioned, with the offensive output, you know, it's pretty much grown every single year he's been in the league, um, almost at 19 points per game. I think, like you said, playing the start of this season without Ja is going to show a lot about how far he's developed this offseason um, because it's really going to be him and Desmond Bain, like in terms of really shouldering the offensive output for that team. Right. Um, so if he's able to step that up in those games, like we're talking about like 22, 23 points a night, while also, again, probably still giving you three blocks a night, a steal a night, like holding it down on a defensive end and also being the number two option on a team that has purely from a regular season standpoint been a top 
three team in the West for the last two years. Um, like that's what I really think Jaron Jackson can do. Um, he has great touch around the rim too. Like I've seen him working on that this off season, like really just being efficient with his movement, like around the block in the paint area and getting to, you know, left-handed finishes, floaters, push shots, like just being efficient and not trying to do too much or do anything too flashy. Um, I think his time with, with team USA is going to help too. And just like being a little bit more open in a system that's different than what he's used to in Memphis. Um, so I am, uh, I I'm high on Jaron Jackson. Obviously he'll be a perennial all defensive guy, but I think if the offense can grow to a level where he's giving you like 22, 23 at night with this same level of defensive production, like, He'll be a perennial all-star. He'll be a guy who is just he'll, – he'll end up being regarded as one of the better players in the league mm -hmm. because of that. Um, so I think that's where Jaron Jackson can go, and I'm expecting that from him, especially to start this season, like you said, with Joss' 25-game suspension. Yeah, he's going to have a huge start to this season. He's going to have a good whole a huge season in general, but the start of the season, he's going to eat the start of the season for sure. Yeah. Um, all right, so getting into the top two. My number two, Zion Williamson, uh, probably to no surprise. It's just, man, when he's on the court, man, he's so good. Like, he just needs to, like, <laughs> just doesn't need to be there. <laughs> just be there, bro. Like, when he's on, like, bro, when he is on the court playing basketball, like, there is a case to be made that he is a top 10 player in the NBA when he's actually playing and he's on the court. And it's, and it's not to say, like, oh, he's putting up stats and, like, they're not winning. It's like, nah, when he's on the court, He's putting up crazy stats, and the Pelicans are contenders. Like, right. he just isn't there. So, like, that's the reason I have him so high because it's like even with the injuries, the upside is crazy. Like, if you can get it – if you could tell me right now Zion Williamson is going to play 70 games and play all the games in the playoffs this upcoming season, there might not be 12 players I'd rather have on in the NBA. Like, that's how high his – If Zion is. could play a whole season, like – He's going to get – I'm not saying he's going to necessarily finish in the top three, but he's going to be in MVP conversations. Oh, yeah, for sure. For like, sure, because the Pelicans are going to be a great team. They're mm -hmm. going to win a lot of games. He's going to put up crazy numbers. Right. Like, it's just a matter of him not being there. That's literally the only critique. That's the only problem. Like, this guy puts up crazy numbers. He shoots 60% from the field. Like, it's – bro, this dude is not even that tall. He's on his 6'6". We just talked about Charles Barkley the other day. <laughs> Working at six six, it's funny because like Zion's doing the same thing, just like obviously like a more like modern day version because you know he could dribble a little bit, bring the ball up. Obviously, you've seen a little bit of point Zion before. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really just a matter of like him staying healthy, him stop getting fat, <laughs> stop eating all that food in New Orleans. <laughs> like he, he just needs to stay healthy, stay in shape, and Zion will be one of the best players in the NBA. It's that simple. If the New Orleans Pelicans training staff cannot figure this out, it is going to be one of the like, – and it doesn't even have to be a career thing. It's just like if his time in New Orleans doesn't pan out and he goes elsewhere, like it's going to be such a big what if, especially for like people in our generation who like watched him come on the scene like during Vine, like in high school where he's – windmill dunking at like 15 years old yeah. against kids who look like they are still in middle school but it's just like he's that much bigger than them in high school it didn't even look real like watching it like watching him in high school i'm like who put lebron in a high school right crazy? exactly it did not look real bro it looked crazy uh yeah point zion is real point zion every time he's healthy and looks good Bro, like, that that little stretch of the season after that Suns game, bro, when he was on the podium, like they sent my guys home last year. Like I took it personal. I was like, nah, league is over. Like it's done. He's about to like wreak havoc. Yeah, bro, just he just can't get on the court, man. It's oh. tough. He's always <laughs> gonna be super efficient, obviously, because I mean, who's stopping six six two hundred and eighty five pounds from getting to the rim? Mm -hmm. Um, so like even in the 39, what 29 games he played this year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he, he, uh, shots almost 61% from the field, like 27, seven and five, 
like it, like you said, it's just a matter of him being there. He just has to stay healthy. So to the New Orleans Pelicans training staff, y'all got it. Like, I don't know what y'all got to do, but y'all, we got to get this right. I'm talking as an NBA fan. I just want to see it. I want to see it. it. <laughs> I, I, can I get 55 games? I don't care if he has to get load managed, no back-to-backs, whatever. It's a random Tuesday night against Utah. I don't want to play him fine. Just let him get through the whole season and let him get into the postseason. Please, bro. Facts. And just listen, let me make this clear too, by the way. For all the people, like all like the, the people on Twitter and this and there, Zion's not a bust. Even if he doesn't like say he gets hurt again, he's not a bust. I don't think that like this should be considered a bust. I opinion. don't think injured like people that get injured to me, that doesn't like bust not to a me bust. is someone that yeah. came in. Yeah, you had the opportunity, you were healthy, it just it's not working, you bro. Stunk. That is a bust. If you come into the league, you're healthy, you're fully fine, you're supposed to be this like great player, and you suck. That is a bust. Guys who just get hurt, get unlucky with injuries. Right. That's not a bust, bro. What 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 can they do? Right. What Greg Oden to me, like people that Greg Oden is one of the biggest busts. To me, I'm like that. He's not a bust. His no. knees fell apart. It's right. not his fault. There's nothing he could do. So like, uh, if Zion, he I'm, doesn't get healthy. Like he's not a bust to me. Either. I'm blanking on the guy name uh, that got drafted by the Cavs that was out the league Anthony in like Bennett? years. Anthony, Anthony Bennett. Bennett. Yeah, that's, a bust. <laughs> that's the yeah, that's, that's the bus. That's a bus. <laughs> like he was there. Another one, and like this ain't even really his fault, but like Hashim to be right. The, the game just changed at the wrong time yeah, for a guy yeah. of his play style. Facts. You could almost say the same thing with like a guy like Jalil Okafor, who was so dominant in college, got high draft pick because of it, and it's like bigs don't play with their back to the basket anymore. Like it just, they just, just switched up at a right. horrible time. Like they kind of just became a – right, it just became a casualty to modern NBA basketball. Yeah. But, like, I'm never going to say somebody is a bust because of injury, especially when, bro, in the 100 games that Zion has played, he's averaging 26, 7, and 4. <laughs> like, he's there when he's not hurt. So, he just he – got to get the injury situation under control – like, I don't even care at this point. Like I said, bro, low management to the max, whatever y'all got to do so that y'all can get adequate time in the regular season for him. Because like you said, before he got hurt last year, the Pelicans for a long period were the one seed in the West. Like they were looking very scary before his injury. Yeah. Um, so if they can keep him for a full season and just get into the playoffs, like we've seen – what this team did without him against the Suns. Imagine if he was there. Like, I just need to see it as a fan. I just need to see it. Yeah. They should they should change the term for guys that get injured. They're not bust. They're just what ifs. You can say what ifs. That's a little bit better. That's more respectable. Right. They're not bust. Um, one more thing, though. Completely side note, completely off track. Um, I have basketball reference pulled up, and they show WNBA highlights. These girls is hooping. Yeah, like, I know it's completely off topic. I'm just looking over like they're going crazy. But all right. Um, number one power forward, I feel like it's it's obvious. Obviously, it's Jared Vanderbilt. Like, yeah, it's just, it's just obvious. Like, why do we even need to talk about this guy? He's just the best in the league. Big Vando. Big Vando. Listen, if he get with Phil Handy, get that corner three, it's over with. He's gonna be on this list. You best believe it. I sub him out for Aaron Gordon. <laughs> nah, I mean, I mean. Is the first person on this list is obvious. It's obviously um I almost said Zion Williamson again. It's obviously Giannis. Um, not even a, a lot needs to be said. One of the best players in the entire league, dominant, got all the stats, got all the accolades, got a championship. Actually, one of the all-time greats already. The resume mm-hmm. speaks for itself. Like, obviously, the best power for in the league. It's not even really debatable. He's in the conversation of is he the best player in the league still? So right. Yeah. He's obviously number one on this list. Um, yeah, he, I think universally, I would imagine has got to be a top five power forward ever. Like, I'm sure probably people that have other people ahead of him. I think he has a case to be four, maybe three is probably pushing it, but like he's, 
Is it though? Is push is three pushing it? I think I think that he has a case for three. I, I think he has a case. All right. You're talking to a dirt fan, so right? okay, okay. Come I was about on, to man. say, look, listen, hey. <laughs> you could say he got a case for two. I you'd be wrong, but I mean you could at least have like you could bring up the, the argument a little bit. Matter of fact, hold on, let me pull up Giannis. Like his accolades are already in ridiculous. If like, you take away like his even just his first two years and just like let me see because I think you can do this on basketball reference. Yeah. If you took away his first two years, his career stats would be 26 points, 10.7 rebounds, five and a half assists, a block and a half, and 1.2 steals on 55% from the field. Bro, this guy, along with what you just said, is a seven-time All-Star, five-time mm-hmm. All-Defensive player, two-time MVP. What is that? Is that? Oh, no, that's the All-Star MVP. He's a champion, obviously, most improved player, defensive player of the year, finals MVP. It's like, bro. Yeah, like, he's got all the accolades already. He's like, only 28. Bro, he's in the con- – like, I think he has a case for two. Like I said, you'd be wrong, but, like, he has a case for two. Like, second greatest power for whatever. I wouldn't put him in front of KG now, but, like, projecting where his career is going to end up, like I said, he's only 28 right now. He'll pass – KG like he will he already has almost half the all-stars he'll pass KG he'll pass like if he just like stays at this level that's all offensively he he's well ahead of Kevin Garnett like Kevin mm-hmm. Garnett never was able to put up these numbers offensively all right it's just um, the defensive side of the ball KG got him beat right now right um but yeah we don't even have to like dive <laughs> into Giannis <laughs> like Bro, if you don't understand Giannis at this point, how are you an NBA fan? Um, he doesn't have no skill, bro. He, how could he be the best? He don't got no bag, bro. Right. That's running dunk, running dunk man. Running dunk man. While well, yeah, bag talk guy over here is freaking in China crying about <laughs> Daryl Morey. I can't <laughs> wait to talk about this. Um, but, yeah, like he – He's number one on the power forwards list, but, like, the conversation for him is really best player in the league and best power forward <clears throat> of all time. And he is right. on the 75th or 75th anniversary team for a reason, which also when you kind of factor in that it's like it was really only 25 players added from the last, what, like 20 it was like five-ish years? years ago. It was like right, 25 years yeah. ago. Right, so like – 25 players from 25 years. He was one of the guys they added to that original 50 list. Like he's going to go down. He could retire right now today and is an all time great retire right now is easily, I think a top five player at his position. You could probably get him higher than that. Um, Like Giannis is unlike any other player we've seen before. Obviously like they call him the Greek freak for a reason. Like bro is seven foot taking it coast to coast in like four steps <laughs> like yeah, he's yeah. he's different bro yeah this is already to me like a top 15 player ever like if we're just talking about just like accolades and what he's accomplished he get retired today he's a top 15 player ever to me at least it's the all nba is the all-stars but it's also the fact that he's so dominant on both sides of the ball like a lot of the all-time greats or even if like even if i'm just looking at power forwards tim duncan being the greatest of all time was extremely dominant on both sides of the ball kevin garnett was a very good offensive player was an elite defender was not as good an offense as a guy like tim duncan was or even Giannis is. dirt one of the most skilled bigs we've ever seen offensively defensively he can't really hold a stick to any of the people that we just brought up so it's like Giannis has the rare combination of being not just like elite, but like elite. And when we are starting to compare him to the greats of the game on both sides of the ball. And so that is really why I think you can, the conversation to start putting him in these like top 20, top 15, top player at his position all the time. Like he has, not just the accolades, but the the play to get it there and like complete dominance on both sides of the ball. Yeah. He does benefit from playing with Brooke, though. 
Real DPOY. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Power Forward was definitely a definitely thin list in comparison. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to do center though because I feel like our list might be. I feel like our list might be kind of different. It's gonna be, I think, probably the most different one that we've done since PG because everyone after point guard has been pretty similar. Right, center um, should be fun. Yeah, so. Since you brought it up, I want to go ahead and get right into this James Harden versus Daryl Morey debacle that has unfolded today. This is crazy, man. International slander <laughs> thrown in front of children, like yeah, li- like- literal kids. Um, so for those of y'all that don't know, Harden has been in China, I think, for the last couple of days during, I think, an Adidas event. Um, and... He was at an event today with a bunch of kids in China and was like talking in front of all of them. And just, I don't know the full context because the clip only showed that part that he said, but it seemed like he just out of nowhere was like, Daryl Morey, this is the direct quote, Daryl Morey is a liar and I will never be a part of an organization that he's a part of. Let me say that again. And then repeated himself and said that Daryl Morey is a liar. He will never be a part of an organization that he is a part of. Obviously, this comes after his initial trade request early on in free agency. But earlier, um, or I guess a couple of days ago, it came out that the Sixers are basically shutting down any trade talks that they had with the Clippers or any other teams on James Harden and planned on bringing him back to training camp. And so in response to that, James Harden basically turned to the 76ers owner and said, it's either me or Daryl Morey because you can't have both. Listen, man. (laughs) James Harden, you ever know that scene from Spider-Man when he's looking at the black black Spidey suit? That's how he's looking at that fat suit. That suit. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's about to be, bro, it's about to get ugly quick. I feel like James Harden is not the guy that you want to have going to that, like, Let's see who fold first. Cause like, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna lose that battle. You're gonna lose the battle, bro. James Harden will be in Miami at them clubs, partying, doing what he got to do. Like James Harden does not care, bro. He don't. He got. He's rich. He got his money. Listen, if he is unhappy somewhere, bro, and he wants to leave, he gonna leave by any means possible. So this whole situation is interesting. It's a little bit weird. Um, cause just because it's like. I, I kind of see where you're coming from. Obviously, we don't have the full details of what's going on, what's been said behind the scenes or whatever. But mm-hmm. from what it seems like, it seems like he was promised that he'd either get a long-term contract extension mm-hmm. or he'd get traded. Like, he just seemed like that was the promises that was told to him. And he feels like their boy went back on those promises. So, to him, I guess he feels betrayed. Like I said, we don't know the full details. We don't know what's been said, what's been promised behind the scenes. But... Just bit going based off of that, I can see why he's a little bit frustrated. But I, it's at the same time, it's like I don't know. James Harden is just wish washy to me. Like he's one minute he wants to be here, the next minute he wants to leave. He wants to go get traded. Like he, like apparently he was like a big say so into why Doc Rivers even got fired. So it's like how you gonna fire Doc Rivers, but then still want to leave? It's like I don't, I don't know what he wants sometimes. I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of he kind of goes back and forth. To me, I can see both sides in this situation, but I feel like, honestly, let me be careful how I say this. In totality, right, like in the summer of 2022, Harden declined his player option, which was going to pay him $47 million. He basically took almost a $14 million pay cut that year um, to try to give them some type of financial flexibility to put a team together, which resulted in this season, which, I mean, they were a game away from the Eastern Conference Finals. When aren't the Sixers a game away from the Eastern Conference (laughs) Finals? Right. Um, In that series, he won them that first game in Boston, you know, without Joel. He had two 40-point games in that series, right? Like, Mm -hmm. And then (laughs) game six and game seven happened at the same time. Um, so I can understand from James Harden perspective of like, look, I'm trying, like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of situation. I took the pay cut because I'm going to take the pay cut when my contract is up, I'm going to get a max deal. Like we cool. We cool. Took the pay cut. Granted, he went out, 
He got them some games early in the series when the chips were really on the table, especially in that game seven. That was not what you want to see out of James Harden. I'm going to ask you a question, actually. Do you think James Harden, like, in a vacuum, all like, let's just say, clean slate, James Harden right now today, do you think he deserves a max contract? No. I mean, if that is – what are we talking max contract? How much is a max contract and how many years? Let me see what the Sixers could offer. Because he is still a, like – obviously well above average NBA player. Like, he's not a bum. He's not a role player at this point. But he is also isn't James Harden, if that makes sense. Like, he's not that guy that's going to go out there and win you an MVP. But he can he can have occasional games where he can go out there and score 40 like he did, and he can go lead the league in assists and run your point guard, facilitate your offense. So it really just, to me, it kind of depends on what the situation is. With the Sixers, again, I need to know how much they're eligible to pay him before I, like, say he's worth or not worth a max contract? With the Sixers, it would be four-year, $210 million. With any other team, it would be four-year, $201 million. I'm not paying him four years. To, no, I'm not doing that. That's too long and too much money. Right. For a if I, if I'm the Sixers, I that wouldn't be a contract I would want to give out anyway because, like, Right now, what is it? Harden's got to be like 33, right? Say Harden is an older he's, player. He's, he turns 34 in like a couple days. So it's like he'll be 38, almost 39. Yeah, nah, that, I'm not paying. The contract would be up. I'm not doing that, bro. That's way too long and too much money for too long. Right. So I, I can see that from the Sixers side of things. But at the same time, if what he's saying is true, right, and, like, he took that pay cut so that they could bring in a different guy and it was, like, almost his underhand deal of, like, I'm going to do this. Y'all are going to give me the long-term good contract, max contract, whatever. And now that we've gotten here, you don't want to do that. That's shady. You know, like, what is mm-hmm. – like, because he didn't – he didn't – he could have just took the player option. It, For real. And he would have been there. Like, you would have had to pay him $47 million. But Instead, he took – 33 and that 15 mil got allocated so that they could go out and get a couple other guys to try to make that that run so if i had to lean one way honestly i would i would side with harden solely because that's like just in the real world it's like you shouldn't promise people that kind of money and then you can't deliver that you know right especially when they do something for you like they take the pay cut like right you shouldn't do that if you got a job offer that was supposed to be like your salary is supposed to be hundred K and you get that first paycheck and it's like, Oh, you only making like 70 and they'll be like, nah, we got you later. You're not just going to be okay with that. No, not at all. I need all that. (laughs) I need all that right now. Right. So especially, especially coming from a guy that you've worked with, like you've been with for years. It's not like Daryl Moore is this brand new GM. Like he's, they're supposed to be close. Like that's supposed to be his right. guy. He done almost rebuilt the Houston Rockets in Philly, brought in Daniel House, brought in PJ yeah. Tucker. He was bringing everybody back, got the whole gang back together. Um, so it's crazy to see like their relationship seemed okay, even though how he forced his way out of Houston last time was so public and like crazy, even then, like going on to the press conference and being like, this team is not good enough. This whole situation is crazy. Like, I need to get out of here, basically. And, like, blatantly told the whole media, like, all the Houston business and was like, I'm, I need to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, even throughout all that, it seemed like him and Daryl Morey were fine. But now that that's not the case, like, if you're the 76ers, <laughs> if you try to, like, this is like it's crazy that you traded him for Ben Simmons. It's like, bro, you're walking into the Ben Simmons situation all over again. You got an <laughs> a huge contract, like second best player on your team. You're Robin to Joel Embiid, doesn't want to be here anymore, and is like refusing to play. Basically, what he said today is like, I'm not going to play another game for the 76ers if Terrell Mori is the GM here. He said, I think I seen a quote. Um, I don't know if this is exactly what the quote said, but it was like, I'm gonna make it as the most uncomfortable I possibly can until they like have to get me out of here. Which is like, bro, and and the process, bro. The process bro. is done. Has it's there over. I, there needs to have been a documentary team following the Sixers like the last dance? And I don't <laughs> know what you would call it, but it would be like 
that's like top tier reality TV. It's just drama going. I just want to know what's really going on behind the scenes. Cause there's no way, like the amount of craziness that's gone on in Philadelphia in the last like three to four seasons, it's gotta be a new record, bro. Gotta be a new record. When when is the process officially done? Like, is it when Joel leaves? Is like, is that like the like nah, yeah. closing? Okay, I was about to say because like, wh- is the process still going? Like, how is this? How is this working? Like, is there gonna be an end to this? Like, is this the end? Like, I don't know. If we Joel- talked about this before. Of like, if you move on from Harden, like how how much longer can Joel and Beads? And I even almost don't want to say patience because I think we're both in the boat of like. We've seen these last couple of playoff runs. Front office is putting people in position. Doc Rivers ain't necessarily the best playoff coach, but like I said, he can't go out there and make you post up. You did not get the ball in the post for the last six minutes in a closeout game to get y'all to your first Eastern Conference Finals. Zero post-ups, bro. It's so disappointing. Like, at some point, the fingers cannot be getting pointed all around the organization. It can't get pointed around, bro. You had Jimmy. Jimmy was there. Jimmy ain't want to play with y'all. You had Ben. Ben don't want to play with y'all. You had James. James don't want to play with y'all. The fingers have got to start getting pointed at Joel Embiid in some extent. I know we talked about it in terms of the like the on-court performance of why their playoff runs keep coming up disappointing the last couple of years. But I don't know, bro. It's a lot of people that get to Philly and get unhappy and then want out. Bro. I'm just – there's too much drama there. There's way too – if I was a player, I don't even want to go near that situation at this point. Not at all. I'm not going – what am I going to Philly for? I'm absolutely not. And just to be a second round exit every single year. This has to be the most disappointing like franchise right now. Cause it's like, well, we promise our fans, like, yo, we're gonna suck for all of these years. But trust me, once we're at the top, it's gonna be worth it, bro. And they got some guys, like they had Markel Folk, like, they had top picks, and just nothing worked out. Nothing. And they have absolutely nothing to show for it. Like, damn. Yeah, the only thing they got to show for it is Embiid's MVP trophy. That's it. That's One it. individual accolade. They started giving out trophies for, for winning the Easter Conference Finals. You don't even got to win the finals against Paul <laughs> right now. You just got to just get there. Bro, they haven't even gotten there. Like, you haven't even gotten to – you haven't even gotten an opportunity to win the runner-up trophy. There, no, you haven't got an opportunity to win the runner-up of the runner-up trophy. Outside of the 2019 playoffs where they lost in game seven on the Kawhi Leonard quadruple bounce shot, like what what is the excuse? Like the year before that, they lost one four to the Celtics. Then you have the game seven loss to the Raptors. Then they get swept in the first round in the bubble against Boston. Then they lose in seven to Atlanta, and that starts the whole Ben Simmons debacle. That was terrible. Then you lose in six games to the Miami Heat the year after that. And this past year, you lose in seven games to Boston, and that game seven was one of the most disappointing performances I've ever seen from a team in an elimination game. And it shouldn't even have got to game seven in the first place. Like, the fact that it even got there is crazy. But that y'all let it get there and then played as terribly at like everybody, but really like Joel and James, the fact that y'all got there and played as terribly as y'all did is crazy. That like we just went through that's like five seasons. I, I, you cannot have this many excuses, bro. At what point? All right. Do you think Joel Embiid is the number one on the championship team? I understand he's an MVP. James Harden is an MVP. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, like I be, I'm like, I'm just saying. If you really think about it, it's like, bro, James Harden won MVP. No one thinks James Harden could be a one on a championship team, even when he was at his MVP level. The fact that he kept coming up short time after time after time, people knew like, all right, bro, it's just not gonna work with him. At what point 
are we going to have that same conversation with Joel Embiid? Like, if we go into this next season, say somehow miraculously James Harden ends up playing, they're a top three to four seed, whatever, they get bounced in the second round. We got to have a discussion, bro. Yeah, we got to yeah. have a talk. I, I, I want to say yes because, like, bro, I see it. You see it every year in the regular season. It's, it's there. <laughs> what, but, like, what does that mean? Bro, that means shit. nothing. I cannot defend, and it was I, that was one of the first times I really got animated on the podcast. Was like, bro, you really didn't have one single post touch in yeah, game okay. six, six minutes down the stretch. This man, Jason Tatum, had one point at halftime, didn't make a field goal. That's got to be the the freest win, and you get to the Eastern Conference final. At least that narrative would die, whether y'all beat the um, the Heat or not. Mm-hmm. At least you made the conference finals, Joel. But no, not a single post touch to close out that game. And you let Jason Tatum catch fire and then he went ahead and dropped 50 on y'all in game seven. It's crazy because that isn't even the most disappointing one. I think the worst one is the Hawks one. The Hawks one is crazy because their team is it's miles better on it's paper. so much better. It's not even funny, bro. Like that to me, that one was the worst one because at least with the Boston one, it's like, all right, Boston is a good team. Like Boston right. was is a better team. The Hawks had no business winning that 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 series. They shouldn't even have went seven. <laughs> no. Like, so that to me, I think that one is the absolute worst one. And the way it happened with the Ben Simmons scared to shoot a layup, like that one was just bad, bro. That was just bad. Didn't didn't they like were they up three two? Like what happened? I swear they blew no, it. No, the the. The Hawks won the first one, then Sixers took game two and three. So it was up two one. And the Hawks uh, were up. Hawks were up three two. Philly won by five to force a game seven. Uh, and I'm pretty sure they were at home. They um, were in game seven. And yeah, they lost at home. Trey Young put up 21 and 10. Kevin Herter had 27 points. Oh, that was the Kevin, Kevin Herter game when he was Kevin Herter open. Okay. Joel Joel did have 30. Ben Simmons had five. Um so I mean yeah. that's just it's just bad, bro. Four field goal. I forgot how wild Ben Simmons thing. And bro, and, oh, Tobias Harris was catching Matt Flack this series because he went eight for 24 in that game seven. I almost forgot about that. But it's like, bro, Tobias you're Harris right. Is the third option, though. Right. You're right, right though. Home, bro. That, this is a conversation that needs to start happening because it's been too many. Different iterations of the 76ers team around Joel Embiid, where the front office has been plug and play different superstars in the league with Joel, and y'all can't make the conference finals. And, and it, you know, the thing is, it's it's not even, I mean, I guess it's bad, but I'm not saying it as in like Joel Embiid sucks. Like Anthony Davis can't be a one on a championship level team. We just said it's only a handful of guys, so it's not necessarily a crazy knock. It just is – it feels crazier when, like, you're the reigning MVP and, like, we kind of got to think about this, bro, because it's Mm -hmm. been – like you said, the process has been going on for a long time now, and y'all have nothing besides your MVP trophy this year to show for it. And we'll get into it at the end of the episode. Some people still, to this day, don't think you should have won this one. Which is, you know, it's crazy, bro. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a conversation, especially after this year, because they're not going to win a championship. We know they're not going to win a championship, whether James Harden is there or not. They're not going to win a championship. They're probably not going to make it out of the second round. I don't know, bro. I don't know. And the the craziest part about this whole James Harden, Daryl Moore situation is after the comments came out and the video was going viral on Twitter, Somebody at the Philadelphia Inquirer is reporting that they still expect him to show up to training camp. What is, bro? What is going on, bro? Bro, just, bro, abolish the whole team, bro. Just like sell the team. <laughs> Blow it up. Blow, Blow it, it up. up. Blow everything. Bro. Do a full rebrand, change the name, go to a different city, just stop everything. I'm just, I'm done with Philly, bro. I, 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 I can't imagine what it's like being like a, diehard 76ers fan bro i lost my mind by now like, no i don't i would have lost like 
what is the worst franchise to be rooting for right now? Like, but that's not like a like the Hornets that just always suck. Like, yeah, like there's gotta be this, really gotta, gotta be, be the Sixers. Cause to me, I would rather be a fan of a team that's like young, rebuilding, not good, always in the lottery, versus mm-hmm. a team that's always like right there and can't never get over that hump. Like being a Cowboys fan hurts because like <laughs> I just, I can't see the NFC Championship game. Like one, I just want to see one with my own two eyes. I don't want to watch Troy Aikman. I want to watch Tony Romo or Dak Prescott. Like can I can I see that or do I need to go back and watch tape delay from the nineties? Like already, on a on a VHS tape. Are the Cowboys the the seventy sixers in the NFL? They Nothing. might be, bro. They really <laughs> might be. That might be the comparison because they they just cannot get over the hump. Not even get over the hump. They just can't. They can't see the hump. They can't make it in. <laughs> um, yeah. So this, I'm, I'm very interested to see how this whole Sixers thing is going to play out. Because of all the people, it, all the players in the league to be in like a contract dispute standoff with, James Harden is like probably the worst one in terms. Of like I really think he'll he'll go there. He'll take it there. He's not going to show up. He don't need the money, so he don't care about no fines you're going to throw at him. Like, he's bro. Listen, he's pulling out that fat suit, and it's slow for y'all. It is slow for y'all, bro. It's, at least, at least when he was in Houston, the fat suit, he was still giving buckets in the fat suit. But this James Harden, bro, he might fifteen and eight. <laughs> like, he, <laughs> he might not give you nothing you need. So. And I also saw. So, like, after the the Lillard stuff came out, where like the NBA sent out a memo basically to Lillard and his agent, all the teams, basically trying to be like, hey, bro, you cannot be saying you're only going to play for the Heat. Don't get traded anywhere else. If you trade me somewhere else, I'm not going to play. To me, this is way worse than that. Like, he, First of all, it's not no back reporting from agents and a reporter here bro, or whatever. Set it it's on like, camera. In front of some kids in China. Like they, don't, they probably don't even really understand what's going on. And what's crazier, I'm not about to get too far into this, but Daryl Morey is like one of the top hated NBA people in China. I heard about that. I like, don't remember what happened, but I he, heard about that. there's like protests in Hong Kong. He tweeted like free Hong Kong. And that's like against, I think, the Chinese government. There's a lot of like geopolitical international mm-hmm. affairs stuff at play. But because of that, like there's a lot of people in China that are anti Daryl Morey for that alone. Harden, bro, you're sick for doing <laughs> of all the places to say that. Like, it doesn't even really make sense. Like I said, you're in a room full of kids. They probably are like, what? But it's like, <laughs> I yeah. see you. You're you're scheming. You're scheming crazy. The funniest part was really the fact that he was like, you're more than a liar. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> like, he's, right. he's like, I'm going to say it again so y'all feel me. He is a liar. I've never <laughs> played on a team he's co- he has ever again. Oh, <sighs> my God. Harden is funny, bro. Yeah. So if you're the 76ers owner, you it, clearly you got a decision. Are you going to trade Harden or are you going to fire Daryl Morey? Uh, his value is so tanked now, though, because the people know he, he wants to leave and he's going to Right. Play. But I just feel like with James Harden, like if I filed, fired Daryl Morey, now what am I going to do with Harden? We're going to lose in the second round. I'm going to have to eventually pay him. Like, let's just rip the mandate off. Just trade him. Because, like, what, like what's going to happen, bro? Like, what's going to happen? If you fire Daryl, you fire Daryl Morey, Harden's going to leave eventually at some point anyways. So, yep. yeah, they're in a terrible spot. They're kind of in a lose-lose situation, if I'm being honest. Because whatever they get back from Harden is going to be garbage. So, it's not going to be – I think the Packers, they said they want a couple picks and an elite player. That's not happening, bro. Not at all. Yeah, definitely not now, like you said, because they have zero leverage <laughs> in um, this situation. Like, whatever little bit of leverage they had beforehand, like, all of that is out the window now. Yeah. Um, yeah, Sixers might be the Cowboys at the NBA. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hey, perfect segue. Right. We, <laughs> go, let's go into the, the NFL part of today's episode, off the glass to off the gridiron. We're going to be talking the NFC East today. I'm not going to start with the Cowboys so I could reserve my energy a little bit. Um, let's start with the Washington Commanders, um, who are in an interesting position. Um, obviously, they finished last um, in the 
division last year. They brought in Jacoby Brissett, who I think is going to probably be in somewhat of a competition with Sam Howell, but I think Sam Howell is going to end up being the QB there mm-hmm. in, in Washington now that they've moved on from Carson Wentz, who sidebar, do you see the picture of him working out in like the, yeah, like the Colts helmet, the Eagles jersey? Oh, the- disgusting. <laughs> that doesn't look so gross. He really is crazy how fast life will come at you in the NFL. Like, bro was an MVP candidate, tore his ACL. Nick Foles wins the Super Bowl. Then, like, his career has just gone off the rails. He just never recovered from that, like, that ever. That's crazy. Um, they bring in Jacoby Brissett, though, bring in David Mayo. Um, Deron Payne was uh, franchised and tagged, and then he got a contract extension. Andrew Wiley as well. Um, made some draft picks to fo- bolster up the secondary um, and some of their offensive line as well. They lose Taylor Heineke and Carson Wentz, as well as J.D. McKissick. Lose a couple of good old linemen and Nick Martin and Trey Turner. Um, they lose Cole Holcomb to your Steelers and then John Bosick as well, as well as Bobby McCain. Um, but they do also get... Eric Bieniemy, who obviously a proven Super Bowl winning offensive coordinator, um, comes in to be the OC under Ron Rivera and joins Jack Del Rio um, as a, a coordinator. So it pretty stacked coordinator room there in Washington. Um, definitely guys with a ton of experience. Um, and for Bieniemy, honestly, I was surprised he took the job. Like I'm, I still don't understand how he hasn't gotten a head coaching job yet. Um, it's just because people think that he's not behind what the success of the Chiefs. Like they just think like, oh, it's all Andy Reid, and then you have Patrick Mahomes. So, like, how much are you really? Because if you don't call plays as the offensive coordinator, like, what do you do? You know what I mean? That's yeah. the only reason why. That's why he made a lateral move to like. Because if I'm, if they have their offense looks great with the, with the I almost said the Wizards. Oh my God, with the Washington <laughs> Commanders, then, uh, then yeah, he, he'll definitely get a head coaching job. Yeah, um, and reports have come out that players are not feeling – so some players have not been feeling his intensity in training camp. But to me, like – They're used to losing. That's I was about to say, yeah, right. nobody <laughs> on the Commanders is Super Bowl winning anything, I don't think. Um, so it's like y'all should listen to the guy that has two ranks. <laughs> yeah, y'all used um, to losing, bro. He's bringing intensity. That's what y'all need. Yeah. What the – I'm so sorry. I look at the – I look at I'm looking at the Washington depth chart. Mm-hmm. The their backup left guard, his name is Chris Paul. Yeah, <laughs> I'm looking at that too. I was like, what? <laughs> um, but looking at this team as a whole, um obviously QB is like the biggest glaring thing on their on the offensive side of the ball, but they honestly like have a good amount of depth at a lot of positions and are are young as well. So like, obviously they have Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson. The receiving room is pretty good too. Like I'd say they're really good. Like four deep. Obviously they have Scary Terry, Jahan Dotson coming off of a pretty good rookie year. You got Curtis Samuel as well, and then um, Deami Brown who has some flashes at points in the year last year. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got Logan Thomas. They have a Pretty good offensive line, especially like um, guard wise with Andrew Norwell and Sam Cosme, um, Andrew Wiley. Like I said, the pickup for them at right tackle. They're bringing back their entire defensive line from last year. Hopefully, tra- Chase Young is healthier and can like really contribute this year. Um, still have Kendall Fuller, um, you know, locking it down as a corner out there. So like. To me, this is the probably the team that will finish last in the NFC East again, barring crazy injury or shakeup. I'm just like just on paper right now. But this is a very solid team still outside of the quarterback position. Like, I think you know what you would get from Jacoby Brissett. Like, he could be like a game manager for you. He's not necessarily going to lose you games. He's not going to win you games. Sam Howell, I think, has much more upside, but he's younger, hasn't gotten the reps yet. So depending on where they go there will dictate, like, what this roster ceiling is. But I'm not going to lie. The commanders, I think, have a above average, like, NFL roster, which will make the NFC East very, very interesting because I think all the other rosters in uh, in the, the division are better, but they're not 
a slouch by any means. I think um I think they're gonna shock a lot of people. It's tough just because this division is really tough, but I think I think defensively, I think this is a great unit. Like I think that I don't think this is a above average unit. I think this is a great unit. Like you have yeah. Chase Young coming on. I think this is a contract year as well. So you know how people they yeah. hoop when it's when it's a contract year. So I like Jonathan Allen. Um I yeah, I think this defensive unit is gonna be great. I, they have offensive weapons. I love Scary Terry. I love Dotson. Um, I think their running backs provide a nice one-two punch. You have Brian Robinson, who's a little bit of a bigger back. You mm-hmm. have Antonio Gibson, who could be a pass catcher and is still a good runner of the of the football. Um, solid tight end and Logan Thomas. He's not great, but you know, veteran tight end. Um, I mean, in the one preseason game they played, their offensive line did look a, bit, a little bit shaky. I don't know how much of the starters was playing, so um, I'm not going to speak too much on that. But if their offensive line could hold up. I feel like I'm higher on Sam Howell than a lot of people are. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, like I said, I haven't watched him in college. I'm just going off with a few times I've seen him play. Even in that game against the Cowboys last year, he showed a lot of promise. He's made some nice throws. That throw, that nine ball he threw down to the scary Terry on the sideline, that was a beautiful pass. He's a little bit of mobile, so he can run. That could be another element to the offense. Then you combine that with, like I said, Eric Bianami coming in, bringing in a whole new system. I think this team could be solid as long as this offensive line holds up because I think Sam Howell has the potential to be at least an average quarterback. Now, what is that going to win you? Probably nothing in this division just because you have the Eagles, you have the Cowboys, right. and you have the Giants, who is also a playoff team, a really good team. So, mm-hmm. unfortunately, it's not really going to win them much. And then when I look at their schedule, the schedule, I see a lot of tough games on here, and even the ones that are – close it's like it can go either way so like i don't know if it's gonna like relate to wins but as far as like you said roster wise i feel like they have a really good roster uh my thing is the only thing i'm worried about is the fact that ron rivera is a is a head coach that is definitely on the hot seat right now Mm -hmm. and i think that if they get off to a slow start and sam howell struggles that he might just make that switch to go to jacoby Brissett. which i guess it could win you more games he probably is going to be a little bit more stable but I mean, is he gonna be your future? No, like no, yeah. you know, Jacoby Brissett isn't that guy. So I mean, if it was up to me, like if it was if this was a head coach that had a little bit more leeway, I think you could see Sam Howell probably playing the whole season. You know, getting that experience, um, making his mistakes because you know the mistakes are gonna come. But I just think that because Ron Rivera is on a hot seat, that he might end up making that switch, and then it could potentially ruin their future a little bit. But like you said, so as far as roster wise, though, this is it's a really underrated roster. Yeah, I think there's like there they could take a game off of everybody else in the NFC East, like especially if some of those later matchups with any of the teams like like and somebody might be resting in terms of like people gearing up for the playoffs, like they could get a split with all the teams in the NFC East and even in the games that they don't win. Like, I think they'll be very competitive in the division Um, and they'll win a lot. I think they could very sneakily win like seven eight games yeah um, i can see that so the, i know we, we said that you know that the afc north was like a pretty tight division where it's like oh, even the teams that are not regarded as like predicted to win the division are also going to be competitive i kind of feel the same way about the nfc east because again to me i think the commanders are probably going to finish fourth and a lot of that i think is just going to be either young quarterback player, you're going to have somebody like Jacoby playing. Um, but their roster is good enough that they'll be competitive even in games that they don't win. Right. Um, let's move on to the the New York football giants who obviously signed Daniel Jones to that massive contract. He's making over $40 million a year now. They had the open contract dispute with Saquon Barkley, who is now – they didn't want to play under the franchise tag. They said, look, we'll give you like 900000 more dollars. And then he was cool with that. So which... dumb. So <laughs> dumb, bro. Just play on the tag because now they could tag you again next year. Right. Um, I saw, I didn't really understand that. But bring back, bring back Matt Breida, Isaiah Hodgins, Sterling Shepard, Darius Slayton. Um, and then like I said they brought in uh, Bobby McCain as well. They traded for Darren Waller. Um, so that's a really big pickup for them as well. And then in terms of the draft, look to bolster down the secondary as well with Deontay Banks. And then one of the biggest names so far out of camp, 
Jalen Hyatt, who has been recorded to have like t- over 24 miles per hour, hit that top speed in training camp. You look like it. You which see those clips? Yeah. That would be the fastest in, in-game speed ever since they were able to start tracking that. Um, so I am – Unfortunately, and this really does pain me to say as a Cowboys fan, I- I'm very high on, the, I think, this Giants team. <laughs> um, like, they didn't really lose a ton. Like, <laughs> Kenny Galladay's not there. He might as well have not been there last year. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, they do lose John Felicio and Nick Gates. Um, Jalen Smith didn't come back. They lost Landon Collins like Tony Jefferson, Julian Love, like they have people that they can work around at those positions. And then when I look at their depth chart, like from a receiver room, like Darius Slayton, Sterling Shepard and come back healthy, Isaiah Hodgins, Jalen Hyatt, you have Wandale Robinson who was hurt, but he had his moments last year. Like they just need a couple of these guys to be healthy and pan out for next year. You were able to get Saquon back, who was the engine of this entire offense. You got Daniel Jones locked up. On top of all of that, you're also bringing in Darren Waller. Um, the O line isn't the greatest, but it's serviceable. Um, it's like that's a real, this is a solid offensive unit. Like again, Saquon is that engine, one of the best running backs in the league. They didn't really have good receiver help for Daniel Jones last year. I think that's going to change this upcoming season. Um, Obviously, health has to be a factor there. And then defensively, like Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams, you got Kayvon Thibodeau. Um, The secondary is not the greatest. Like Adoree Jackson is probably their best corner. Um, You still have Xavier McKinney and Jason Pinnock out there um, at the safety position. Linebacker room is a little thin, but – I think they're just they're gonna put up a lot of points. Like their offense is going to be like their offense was good last year with the lack of receivers that they had. And I think right. that the addition of not just receivers, but just receiving weapons as a whole, when you also factor in Darren Waller, um they're gonna put up a good amount of points last year or next year. So I don't I don't think the holes in their defense are going to be as big of an issue because they can lean to their offense to kind of win some shootouts. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I agree. I think that the Giants offensively is a really good unit. Um, Like you said, Saquon being pretty much the leader on this offense, he can carry an offense, but the fact that you add in, like you said, a lot of these receivers who aren't the biggest of names or aren't the best of receivers, but collectively as a unit are way better than what they had last year. Mm-hmm. That is going to take a lot of pressure off of Saquon. He's not going to have to be their best rusher. And I think also last year he was their leading receiver as far as like receptions go. Um, so that's going to take a lot of pressure off of him. Obviously you bring in more receiving weapons. That's going to help out Daniel Jones, him having more receiving weapons. Cause I like a lot of these guys. I like Paris Campbell a little bit. I like Darius. Yeah. I even like Isaiah Hodgins. He had a lot of good games later in the season last year. Right. I like Isaiah Hodgins. Like you said, Jalen Hyatt looks as fast as ever. And then Wando Robinson, if he can get back healthy, that's another weapon you got there. So you don't need one of these guys to be top 10, 15 receivers. You just need all of these guys to contribute a little bit. And then your real top receiving weapon is going to be Darren Waller. I think Darren Waller is going to lead this team in targets, lead this team in receptions. Like he's going to be like that. How how Kansas City did it last year, just to a lesser extent, obviously, because he's not Travis Kelsey. Mm-hmm. And obviously, Daniel Jones isn't Pat Mahomes. But as far as like leaning on your tight end to be that top receiver. And then you just need guys to just come along for the ride. I think that they can do that. And then along with the fact that Daniel Jones is going to have another year in this system, another year with Brian Dable, if, even if it doesn't work out as far as the passing game, say the passing game could go, could be a little slow in certain games. They still have that threat of Saquon being an elite rusher. And then Daniel Jones using his legs and becoming an elite, like rushing quarterback. So I think offensively, this team is going to be really good. And like you said, if the defense, um, can just like keep them in games. I think there's gonna be, I think there's gonna be games where their offense definitely wins them some games this year. And I think you're gonna see a little bit of a, a leap from Daniel Jones. I don't know if it's gonna be a full, like a full on top 10, top five quarterback breakout season, but mm-hmm. he's definitely gonna throw more than 15 touchdowns. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. He's definitely gonna throw more than 15. 
But even then, it was good to see him protect the ball, not turn the ball over, especially the fact that he didn't really have a lot of receiving weapons. Now you give him more receiving weapons, another year in the system. I think you can see a really good year out of out of Daniel Jones. And they, you know, he went out, won the playoff game in Minnesota as well. Um, like I think this will be a good year to really see what Daniel Jones ceiling can start to be. Like he's got the adequate weapons around him. Um, all right, I'm about to get in my bag real quick. Let's talk about just, the Dallas Cowboys. I'm gonna just sit back, bro. You go ahead, do your <laughs> thing. Bro. I'm gonna just sit back and listen. Um, when you look at who they brought in, franchise tag 20. Don't Pollard. say they say we rep your team, Billy. Say what we brought in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, franchise tag, Tony Pollard, Cooper Rush is coming back to be the backup. Jonathan Hankins, Tack McKinley, Terrence Steele, bring back Vander Esch and Dante Fowler. Two big offseason trades. Um, they traded a fifth and a sixth to go and get Brandon Cooks, who had um, turbulent stint in Houston um, and seems like very excited to be in. Dallas, which we were definitely in need of just another receiving threat. <laughs> um, also go out and get Stephon Gilmore, who is definitely getting up there in age, but they were able to get him for a fifth round pick. Um, he had a, a solid year last year. And in terms of the draft, obviously we needed to address run defense, interior presence. So they go out in the first round, they get Mozzie Smith, who is a monster they had to literally go and change a machine when he was at Michigan because he literally couldn't put any more weight on it and he had already Mm -hmm. maxed the machine out that's crazy we lose Dolan Schultz which definitely hurt me I think he's one of the better tight ends in the league but we go out and get Luke Schumacher Macher in the draft and also everybody saw the Deuce Vaughn pick as well we get Anthony Barr and uh or we lose Anthony Barr sorry and lose Anthony Brown as well but the biggest thing to me about this Cowboys team and why I feel the way I do going into this year, which is in general, like a lot of y'all know Cowboys fans. It's like a, every year this, we're going to the Super Bowl. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm not one of those guys from a very young age. I got very, I, I learned to cap my expectations for the Dallas Cowboys. I sat there and watched Tony Romo drop the, the hold on the field goal attempt and get tackled at the one-yard line and we <laughs> lost to Seattle. And I, I was just like, yeah, your season's over because <laughs> he dropped the snap. So ever since then, like what can I, – I know what can go wrong will go wrong for the Dallas Cowboys. So I, I keep my expectations low. I like to say I'm probably the most realistic Cowboys fan there is. Never look. Agree to that. I All right. Agree to that. Sometimes it may sound like I'm not a fan, but I, again, I'm just trying to be. I'm trying to be real with myself because I'm not. I can't. Every year I cannot go in with this year as my year because my heart's been broken too many times, bro. Too many times. What gets to me about this team is I really don't have faith in Mike McCarthy as a play caller. That is scaring me mm-hmm. very much. The last time he was a play caller, obviously, was in Green Bay. He kind of was holding Aaron Rodgers back before he ended up being canned in Green Bay. They get rid of Kellen Moore. They bring in Brian Schottenheimer. But Mike McCarthy came out. He said that he's going to be calling the plays. I'm nervous. <laughs> I, I'm nervous. I would be. <laughs> I was. I was vocal about – having displeasure about play calling at times when Kellen Moore was the play caller. And a lot of that I felt like just had to do with inconsistencies with the run game. It felt like we would go way too long as stretches of games, which is getting too dependent on Dak and too dependent on being pass heavy out of the shotgun. When it's like Zeke is on this big contract, especially last year when you have Zeke and Tony Pollard and they're both, especially Tony Pollard, like being as dynamic as a running back. And it's like, we just abandoned the run game for like quarters at a time. Like, bro, this is the NFL. You come out and shotgun over and over and over and over. And it's so many passes. Teams are going to play that better, especially as you get later and later into games when like, now you have to pass, but Dak's already thrown 35 passes. Like, right. That was my biggest complaint. 
schematically, I think Kellen Moore is a great offensive mind. I think he's going to do wonders for Justin Herbert and the Los Angeles Chargers. I am very afraid mm-hmm. with Mike McCarthy. I have no no issues with the defense. This defense is about to be crazy, stacked, one of the best defensive units in the NFL. We were able to keep, keep Dan Quinn. I don't know how. I thought after last season. That was season, crazy. I thought certainly he was going to become a head coach. Yeah, that was crazy. I don't know how y'all kept him. <laughs> defense is playing out of his mind. He one came back. I don't know what type of deal Jerry Jones cut under the table. There's got to be something more there because if I like, there's no way Dan Quinn couldn't be a head coach again. Either way, he's back. I zero concern <laughs> with the defense, mm-hmm. none at all. No Every, Trayvon Diggs on a double move. You not worry about that. You, you no, <laughs> no, no, not. <laughs> Every single position is loaded, bro. Demarcus Lawrence on the edge. You got Mozzie Smith, Jonathan Hankins, also Odigizuo on the inside. Micah Parsons on the other edge with Dante Fowler, too, and Tack McKinley. You still got Jabril Cox, Lane Van Der Esch, holding it down into your linebacker. We keep Jordan Lewis to be our slot guy. Deron Bland still here who played really well, kind of in the nickel as a corner as well. Obviously, now we have Diggs and Gilmore, two like very, very good corners who can play out, match up against best receivers. We now have two of them. Obviously, Stephon Gilmore is getting up there in age, but experience, like you can't really match what he's like. He's a Super Bowl winning cornerback and one of the best right. cornerbacks we've seen in the last you know decade or so. Mm-hmm. Malik Hooker, Donovan Wilson, Jaron J. Curse, all at the safety position. Like this defensive unit is stacked. Concern just goes back to the offense, bro. A, we don't have a bruising running back. I'm very concerned about short yardage situations. You have all small guys. Yeah. That's it. Nothing. It, like small. Tony Pollard is like is the best bruising <laughs> running back we have. Deuce Vaughn is. Five. Hey, man. Don't sleep. He was hoping. No, he looked good. He looked good. Game. What are we doing if it's fourth and goal? Give it to Deuce Vaughn. They can't even find him. He's going to sneak under people's legs. He's not, he not even going to be able to see him. Uh, I think Brandon Cooks is definitely an upgrade. CD, Brandon Cooks, and Michael Gallup, that's a, a solid enough receiving room. I really am going to miss Dolan Schultz. I like Jake mm-hmm. Ferguson, though. I think Jake Ferguson is capable, but I think Dolan Schultz is just a tier above. All the guys we have right now at tight end, Side note, I heard he was doing good in camp. Like I heard like training camp news. He was playing, he was doing solid in Jake Ferguson. Yeah. No, he he had good stints last season. Um, so I think he he'll be, you know, solid in his role. We were able to get Zach Martin's contract situation done today, which is also very good. The offensive line, I still would say, is above average. Like Tyler Smith is very good. He's gonna be the left tackle whenever Tyron Smith retires. Still have Tyron Smith now, though. Tyler Biotis is a good center. Zach Martin, obviously, is one of the best guards, if not the best guard in the NFL, one of the best O-linemen, period. Terrence Steele also solid. Like, the whole offensive line, I think, is very good. I don't have the same issues with Dak to the extent that other people do. I was a Dak defender for many years. What I will say is, I can't defend what happened in that 49ers game. <laughs> that was inexcusable. You just can't, you cannot throw those interceptions there. And the interceptions were bad. They the were one on, very bad. The one on the crow route, bro, I lost my mind watching it. It was like, <laughs> you, it was like a blind read. It was like, you looking this way, you turn back to the curl and, and just, just threw, it. threw it. The corner, oh, the corner done jumped the route before the ball came out. It's like he was throwing it to the corner. So that that's my concern. I don't think that Dak is a bad quarterback by any means. I think people are taking it way further than it needs to be. I know we talked about on last episode, people out here tracking training camp stats. I've seen people going crazy. To your your boy on Fox Sports, whatever his name is. I still remember his name. Brian. Come on, Carlton. Carlton, Carlton? whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. He out here did a whole segment, broke down training camp stats from Dak. It's like, That's bro. That's weird. I'm telling you, it's only because he's a Cowboys quarterback. Is he getting this level of scrutiny? And like, you kind of just have right. to live with that when you have a star on your helmet. But 
In reality, like I said, zero concern about the defense. This is a top three, top two. De- like on paper, it might be the best defensive unit in the NFL, but it's going to probably be a top three defensive unit in terms of output. My concern is with Mike McCarthy, who has not called plays in, I think, over a decade. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't want Mike McCarthy to begin with. I thought Jerry Jones just went out and got the biggest name because – He's Jerry Jones. This is the Dallas Cowboys. So maybe I'm a little biased there. I don't have the faith. I hope it goes well. I'm just, again, like I said, I capped my expectations. I'm not expecting, I'm expecting the offense to regress. I could see that. I could, I could, <laughs> which is, re- that. which I'm telling you now, come, if, if the offense gets worse and, where early playoff exit or scrapping to make the wild card, or whatever. I'm going to be so livid because for so many years, it literally was like Tony Romo has the people around him, but our the, the defense, the secondary couldn't cover the bed if they were a blanket. <laughs> that even used to be horrible. I remember that. that used to Jeff be Heath so was a star in safety for a long time, bro. And it's no disrespect to Jeff Heath. But, bro, if you wasn't coming up and hitting somebody, it was free. Everything was <laughs> free back there, bro. <laughs> and it's like Tony Romo is trying his hardest in a shootout after shootout. And it's like now we have one of the best defensive units in the NFL. And Maybe we're the gonna best get, defensive player in the NFL. Maybe. Right. And we're going to get held back by our, our play caller. I'm going to lose it, bro. I'm going to lose it. Listen, you got to have faith, bro. You got to have faith. Listen, the way I see it, I, I, I kind of do share some of the same um, worries as far as Mike McCarthy, just because he's not even the best with what he did now as a head coach as far as, like, clock management and just making decisions in general. So it's like if you add more onto his plate, right? like, that's only going to make that other stuff worse. So that and along with the fact that, like you said, y'all don't have – a bruising, give me 25 carries running back. Like, I love Tony Pollard. I think he's going to be great. He might be fantasy biased as well. I love Tony Pollard. But the way you guys are talking, like, okay, we're going to run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. This dude said that we, like, Kellen Moore was scoring too many points. Like, we need to slow the game down, give our defense a break. Who said that? That's what Mike McCarthy said. That's why he's calling plays. You didn't know he's bro. He literally oh said, "Oh my gosh, bro!" He said, "He said he was like Kellen Moore is in the the what exactly did he say in the world of scoring points. I'm in the world of winning games or something like that. So I don't know. How, man, how, how do you want to win a game? I didn't. I didn't know you could win games in in any sport. Period. Without scoring points, I thought you had to like put points on the board if you wanted to win the game. <laughs> Hockey, soccer, football, basketball, baseball, cricket, lacrosse, bowling. You gotta put points on the board, bro. Like, gosh, I can't. I can't. Bro. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad we're doing football. This is so fun. <laughs> I can't. Like, bro, what does that mean? What does that mean, bro? Basically, what he was saying was, like, all right, um, like, you guys scored. This is his word. I don't know. This is how he thinks. You guys are scoring too many points, too fast. Defense is not getting enough of a break. There's too much on Dak's plate. Like, he's airing the ball out, throwing the ball all the way down the field, blah, blah, blah. I can agree with that. Yeah. The, I think the way he I, – I know what he means. The way he's saying is, like, let's score less so we can win more. Like, I don't – the way he said it, I don't think that's what he really meant. But okay. the way the way you guys are talking, like, all right, we want to be a run first team. Like, you guys want to run the ball, maybe slow the game down a little bit. I think the pace of play is going to go way down without Kellen Moore. Um, yeah, like I said, I just don't think that fits with the offseason moves you guys made. It's like, all right, we're going to let go of Zeke. Obviously, you guys are paying him too much money. Cool. Yeah. But let's also get Brandon Cooks. It's like, all right, so now instead of having a bruiser running back, we added another receiving weapon, and now all of our running backs are fast, speedy guys, like not bruisers. It's like you would think that y'all are going in more of the direction of a pass first, like let's air it out type of team. Right. So I just think the offseason moves, which I like, don't get me wrong. Like I like, love the Brandon Cooks edition. I think CD is a solidified one. Yeah, I really just needed like a solidified number two over there. Mm-hmm. Um, Sony Pollard, I like the fact that he's fully going to get the keys because I feel like 
Zeke was effective in certain He's effective in his own way as far as being a goal linebacker, every down just kind of bruiser, getting those tough yards. But Tony Pollard was the one that had that burst. Um, yeah, like I said, it just doesn't fit with what you guys are saying in the offseason versus what you guys are actually doing as far as your move. So yeah. I'll be interested to see how it looks because offensively or as a the team as a whole is a Super Bowl caliber roster. Yeah. Like as a whole. It's like definitely a top tier contending team type of roster. It just comes down to Mike McCarthy and what the offense is going to look like. Because I am worried, like, if they are really going to have this run-first mentality, are you going to give Tony Pollard 20 to 25 carries a game? I don't think that's the best way to even use him. I don't even like him doing that in general. I think he should be around, like, a maybe give him 15 carries and then get him out in space and give him some, like, five to seven catches a game. Yeah. Like, just not – just ground and pound. So, yeah, it would make more sense if you guys actually signed Zeke back to like a like a lesser deal than how it would make a lot more sense. But like I said, it's it's just gonna be interesting to see what the offense is gonna look like. Cause I like you, I have no worries about the defense. The defense is right. gonna be elite. Like we're not even we don't even need to talk about that. But offensively, the play calling wise, it's gonna be really, really interesting to see. And that's really gonna be deter- the 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 determining factor to whether they can win a championship or not. Yeah, because look. As much as people want to harp on Zeke, a lot of it is, again, attached to when you look at how his play is in relation to his contract. Right. As a running back, though, like Zeke really made the transition from being who he was coming out of Ohio State to his last few years. He's really been like short yardage guy. And even you could see it in his run style, like he gets the ball, he picks a hole. And he's going to fall forward for like four or five yards. Mm-hmm. Um, and you need someone like that on your roster because in the red zone, that's the difference between seven points or three points. Mm-hmm. Like Super Bowl champions get seven points. People that bow out in the playoff settle for three. So not to say that it's going to hinder the entirety of the offense, but like that's very critical to finishing drive strong. And even just like in any short yardage situation – there's not a great running option there. Um, on top of Zeke is probably one of the best pass protecting backs in the league and has been for a long time. And that is a deficiency in Tony Pollard's game. I, I've got to imagine it's got to be a deficiency in Deuce Vaughn's game. Just sorry, <laughs> just off of sheer size. Like, bro, if Fred Warner is coming up the middle. I'm taking Fred 10 times out of 10. No shade to Deuce Vaughn, but like, it just, bro is small like Malik Davis is also small as well like y'all have no like Rojo is your best like bruiser he sucks like Rojo just flat out stinks and he's suspended for like the first two games that too so yeah look we can move off the Cowboys um I am just I'm in a weird spot with this team I think last year was an opportunity for us that was missed and I think we'll look back on that in a couple of seasons and be like, dang, because this defense cannot stay this good for this long. Money is going to have to get dished out. Dan Quinn is eventually going to dip. I, he can't stay here forever. So it's really in my head like this now or never. It's got to happen now because I can't imagine Dan Quinn being here another year. And like I said, money's going to have to get dished out. So roster's not going to get much better than this. Right. Let's pivot to the last team here and touch on the Eagles before we give our, our final standings and wrap everything up here. Um, quickly with uh, the Eagles, um, they brought in Rashad Penny, Terrell Edmonds, uh, Elite, uh, I can't remember, I forgot to pronounce his first name, Zacchaeus, <laughs> receiver from the Falcons, um, DeAndre Swift as well, who they were able to trade for. Howie Roseman is continually cheating, I swear. So oh, this Howie team is teams together. Yeah. Like, bro, I just looked at it and got disgusted. Like, this team is stacked right. from on top, top to of, bottom. On top of the fact that this is basically the NFL version of the Georgia Bulldogs, obviously getting Jalen Carter. <laughs> uh, bringing Nolan Smith, Kiwi Ringo as well. Really not a ton of bad losses for them either. Like they lose Robert Quinn and Javon Hargrave. But like I said, they just brought in Nolan Smith and Jalen Carter. So like easily address both of those positions. Um, they lost uh, Ndamukong Sue, but again, he's older. Jalen Carter looks like an absolute freak. I don't even care about any of the he, people that they lost up there. He had number one overall 
like talent and drop two ten to the Eagles, who just came out of the Super Bowl. That's fun. How do y'all let that happen? Like, how does anyone pick in one through nine? How do y'all let that happen? How? Please tell me how. And then, and then Nolan Smith drops all the way to the last pick of the draft to who? The Eagles. They're cheating, bro. I don't know what. <laughs> what Howie Roseman is sleep. doing? They got Ke- Kelly Ringo. Like he, I think like he had to pick that sealed the national championship game. That's what I'm saying, and that's like they're like third string corner. Like they just have elite players, even backing up their elite players. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's like this is a college roster. You know how like Alabama and Georgia be, where they have the five star right. here. The third string is also a five star. Like bro, that's how the yeah. Eagles are, bro. It's sick. It's truly Looking- sick. Looking at their whole depth chart, obviously they got Jalen Hurts at QB, who took a massive leap last year. We talked about it last episode. We're expecting a, a bigger year from him passing, and obviously we know what he's able to do um, with his feet. There are four running backs deep, and they all have different roles. Obviously, Rashad Penny and DeAndre Swift. Kenneth Gainwell has been a great receiving back for them. Boston Scott always randomly pops off for them and is a great short yardage back. So, it's like, they're four deep there. They have A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith still here. Obviously, still have Quez Watkins for that speed threat. They brought in Zacchaeus as well. They still have Dallas Goddard. They might have the best offensive line in the (laughs) NFL on top of all of that. They got Jason Kelsey to come back, who I kind of was expecting he was going to retire last year after, like, you made the Super Bowl run. Just you got to play against your brother. It's like, great. I thought he was a Cowboys fan and you talking. Because in reality, Jason I'm Kelsey him, is one of my favorite players. When I used to play, I used to watch Jason Kelsey highlights. And be like, I want to play like him. I'm just saying, I'm like, if I'm him, I'm like, bro, we could run this back. Like, we we should be in the Super Bowl again. Yeah. So between him, Jordan Mailata, Landon Dickerson, and Lane Johnson, like <clears throat> they're stacked on the offensive line. The defensive line is just as good, if not better, um, with Josh Sweat. Derek Barnett, Brandon Graham. Like, bro, these are all guys playing the same position. That's not fair. <laughs> Fletcher Cox, Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, all on the interior. Like, bro, they're all going to be fresh. Like, they're going to be able to rotate between Fletcher Cox, Jordan Davis, and Jalen Carter. And then also have Hassan Reddick and Nolan Smith. They got Kobe Dean as well. And then... I mean, they got Darius Slay. They got James Bradbury, Devontae Maddox. We talked about Keely Ringo. They brought in Terrell Edmonds. If this team doesn't win the Super Bowl, it's a disappointment. I'm just like, if we're just being <laughs> honest, bro. If this team does not win the Super Bowl, not get to again, this team is absolutely loaded, bro. Yep. Loaded. They have no, like, none, no weaknesses. None at all. Let's just get into it. Prediction for the standings, I think obviously both of us have the Eagles winning the NFC East. For all the reasons that we just said, this team is literally so absurdly stacked on paper. It's not even funny. It hurts me to even talk about the Eagles as a Cowboys fan. (laughs) Um, And Jalen Hurts was my quarterback in fantasy last year. So it was like always like bittersweet. (laughs) It's like he's taking them to heights I have not seen a Cowboys player get to in my lifetime. He's that guy, bro. Um, and the team got better. So I have the Eagles first. Who do you have finishing second in the NFC East? Um, so I have I think I have the Cowboys finishing second. Now, the only reason why it's tough for me because like I can't really determine strength of schedules because obviously I just see tough games on here for everybody. But yeah, I think I have the Cowboys finishing second just because we've talked about it, like they have a Super Bowl caliber roster around them the only question mark is just going to be how the play calling is going to play out but at the end of the day if you have elite players on the field you're going to produce and with that defense being as stacked as it is they're going to win games off their defense alone like they blow out minnesota off their defense every year just off the fact that like (laughs) kirk cousins is running for his life so like there's going to be a few games like that this season probably more than a few for a bunch of different teams to where their defense alone just wins them games so even if that offense isn't high powered Bro, if y'all scored 24 points, y'all probably going to win that game (laughs) because the defense is not going to give up that much. So I have the Cowboys finishing second. I think it's going to be very, very tight 
between the Cowboys and the Giants for whoever finishes second in the NFC East. I think both of them will be in the playoff hunt and probably make the playoffs like this past year where you had three teams from the NFC East make it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can see a world where it's the Giants and not the Cowboys. And again, like all of that comes down to really how this offense looks with Mike McCarthy as a play caller. Like I said, I'm very pessimistic about how that's going to play out. Um, so for now, if I had to had to pick, I'm going to take the Cowboys because the defense is so absurd. Um, but I, just, I would not be surprised. It would be a very Cowboys thing <laughs> for them not to do that and end up being the last wild card team and have to play the number one seed Um or whoever, whatever, the number two seed in the, um, the first round of the, the playoffs. So, okay. And side, side note, too, the Giants and the Cowboys are tied as far as strength of schedule. So, it's it's even. And the Eagles have the number one strength of schedule, obviously. Mm-hmm. It just don't came up with the Super Bowl. I just needed to see that real quick. I needed to see because that, that is a determining factor, too, how many tough games you play. Because, like, the Eagles obviously are were a stacked team last year, but, like, if we're being for real, they really didn't play many great teams or great quarterbacks mm-hmm. last year. They still were good. I'm not saying to discredit them, but, like, this year it's going to be even harder, which I still think they can easily be the number one team in the NFC yeah. just because they're that stacked, but it's not going to be as easy as it was last year. Like, last year yeah. they had games where they won the game by the second quarter, and they were just running the ball for the rest of the game. Yeah. So, the Cowboys, I think, also have a tough stretch to end their season as well. Like, the Seahawks are going to be formidable um, again, and then that's their last game in November. Then they run the Eagles, the Bills, the Dolphins, the Lions, and then finish the season um, – against the commanders and this game is in washington so like that could be a sneaky one that could be a one right. where like you ruin in playoff season if you're washington right and so it's like realistically like the eagles game bills game dolphins like eh, lions also like with how they're kind of projecting in the nfc north like none of those games are going to be easy they're all winnable for the the talent on the Cowboys roster, but mm-hmm. those are games that you're going to need to probably make the playoffs again, because this division is going to be tight and you're going to have to play the giants twice before that point. Um, you'll have a game against the Eagles and the commanders. And then you know, also against teams like the jets, the Niners, the Chargers. So it's like, they're going to have some losses already in the column and then have to finish on that five game stretch. So like you don't have to come out of that, decently and in general you just want to be hot going into the playoffs anyway so right yeah like because of that i can really see a world where the cowboys do end up finishing third i hope they finish second i hope they win the super bowl as a fan but it's just <laughs> like we just got to be real so i have eagles one cowboys two giants three and two and three are very close and then the commanders four okay yeah i have it the same way oh no you said giants two giants two right Cowboys too, but oh, okay. like, like it's very Close. tight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have yeah. Eagles one. I have Cowboys two. Giants three. And I really like they're gonna finish fourth probably unless injuries happen to the other first three teams. But the Commanders are not gonna be a team to sleep on. Like I genuinely feel like they're they might not win a lot of games, but they will ruin some games for some teams. Like they will ruin seedings for some teams. Like mm-hmm. especially in your guys' division. Like those later in the season games, like you said, like. They're they're going to be annoying. They're going to be pests, but they're they're definitely going to come in fourth. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's get into this tier list to wrap up the episode. Um. So what we're about to do is we're going to put the best runner up MVP seasons of the last, basically from two thousand on, into a tier list, and basically see which MVP runners up had the best seasons overall compared to each other. So I went through, I think I have nine seasons here um, where guys, some of them are like the most controversial MVP runners up in NBA history. Some of them are guys who just put up crazy stats and just, you know, whoever ended up winning that year had a better story, team success, whatever. Um, So let me go ahead and set all of this up really quick. Um, 
and then I need to share the screen. Cool. So y'all should be able to see the tier list now if you are watching on YouTube. So I'm going to go in order here. So the first one I have is the 2002 NBA MVP went to Tim Duncan, who put up 25, 12, and three and two and a half blocks. The runner up that year was Jason Kidd, who I think this was the year the Nets went to the finals. Um, he put up 14.7 points, 7.3 rebounds, and 9.9 .9 assists with two steals. Um, and it was actually pretty close. He had, I think he only lost by, what is this, like 50 points, give or take, in the ward voting. So pretty close in terms of a tight race. So what rating would you give that Jason Kidd um, season on the Nets? Again, 14, 10, and 7, basically. 14, 10, and 7, but he had two steals as well. I mm -hmm. think, yeah, I think you are right. I think that's the year they did go to the finals. Yeah. I don't know how much I'm going to factor that into because this is just MVP. All right. It definitely not as, I think maybe B. Yeah, they I'm, went I'm 52. Gonna... They went 52 and 30 as well, like as a team. Okay. Um, and I'll go B. I feel like B feels right too. Mm. Like, this is an impressive, like, 14 and 10 is not like crazy in today's NBA. You think about older NBA and also Jason Kidd, like being a point guard, also giving you seven rebounds and two steals um, is impressive. So I feel like B is probably a good spot for that. All right. Um, okay. The next one I got here is 2002, 2003, Kevin Garnett. This is another Tim Duncan MVP season. Um, this one's not as close. I think the, the award point difference was about 100. But Kevin Garnett put up 23 points, 13 and a half rebounds, six assists, uh, 1.6 blocks per game, and 1.6 or 1.4 steals per game. Um, so he actually averaged basically the same amount of points as Tim Duncan, averaged about half a rebound more, two more assists. Um, but Tim Duncan did average almost three blocks a year. So he basically doubled his, his block total, but was pretty much on par or above Tim Duncan's counting stats um, that year. So where would you put big tickets MVP or MVP runner up season in 2003? They finished 51 and 31. 51. I think this one's definitely a, I think this one's a, um, okay. it, I was tearing between a and S, but I, I think it's going to be A for me. 13 rebounds, 23 points. Obviously, the defensive impact is crazy. Yeah. Having, what was it, 1.6 blocks and 1.4 steals as well. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. But, you know, I think it's I think it's going to be A. Okay. Dang, Timmy is ruining Like, bro, Timmy is ruining some good seasons, bro. God damn, Tim. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be two different Steve Nash MVPs on this list or MVP runner-ups because both of his MVPs are extremely controversial. Uh, so the next one I have here is 2005 MVP runner-up Shaquille O'Neal. This was a very, very tight race, only a 30-point difference um, in the final vote tallies. Steve Nash won this MVP putting up 15 and a half points, 11 and a half assists per game. Shaq put up 23 points, 10 rebounds, 2.7 assists, and 2.3 blocks per game. And the Miami Heat were, let me pull up their record from that season, 59 and 23, um, and ended up going all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals and took the Pistons um to seven games in the eastern conference finals i think this one this one might be b the only reason why i think it's b is because i'm when i think of Shaq and i think of his mvp seasons like mm -hmm. his like other mvp seasons are yeah. so great that like just in comparison i feel like it just doesn't hit the same yeah okay okay um the next one i have here is the next season so 2005 2006 steve nash goes Back to back, this one is crazy. So gross. Um, <laughs> he puts up 18.8 points, 10.5 assists, 
and four rebounds. And the runner up that year was a 21 year old LeBron James who put up 31, seven and seven with 1.6 steals and a block. Um, Bro, like, what are we talking about here? Which year? Which year was this? This was oh six. Yeah, so this is this is two thousand five, two thousand six season. Kobe wasn't the runner up this year. Wasn't this the year Kobe had like averaged like thirty seven or like thirty six or something crazy like that? He is he averaged thirty five this year. He came fourth in MVP voting. Well, oh yeah, because they were so bad. I forgot about that. They were terrible. Yeah. I think that team sucked. But yeah, thirty one. This was 06. How many games did that Cavs team win? 50. On the S. Knot. S. 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 This is S. Like, what a couple. They, on, only, they only won four less games than uh, than the Suns. Bro, Steve Nash, like, S. <laughs> Just put Brian in S, bro. I can go on and on about Steve Nash, bro. I feel like he done took away his MVPs. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I was a kid back then, so I didn't fully get to watch it live. Maybe you just had to watch it to experience it because just looking back, reading the numbers, or just watching it back, it don't. I don't know. I don't see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> look, yeah, look, thirty-one seven and seven as a twenty-one year old in 06, bro. Thirty-one points in 06 is crazy. It's like somebody averaging like thirty-eight now. Like everybody on, well, I, I can't say that because Chauncey Billups finished fifth and he averaged basically the same amount of points as Steve Nash. But Dirk finished third this year, 27 points a night. Kobe came in fourth, 35 points a night. D Wade is up here at 27. Shout out Elton Brand, he on the list, 24. Mm-hmm. Uh, a night, too. Be a bucket, definitely a bucket. Um, but yeah, Steve Nash, both of them, some of the most controversial MVPs. Um, we're going to jump forward a little bit in years here to the 2010, 2011 season, which is Derek Rose's MVP year, the runner up that year. And honestly, you could almost make a case for two different people, but I I didn't want to put LeBron on here too many times. Um, but Dwight Howard ended up coming second in voting. Derek Rose won the MVP 25 points, 7.7 assists a steal and four rebounds. Dwight Howard averaged 23 points, 14 rebounds, and 2.4 blocks. And this season, the Orlando Magic ended up finishing with 52 wins, um, but did lose in the first round to the Atlanta Hawks. Mm. But, I mean, bro, 23, 14, and two and a half blocks. And this was peak of his powers, Dwight, like yeah, different bro. level. Yeah, bro. Cause like like even this whole like little four four year span, it was like damn near 14 rebounds, 13 rebounds, 14 rebounds, 14.5 rebounds. And then this is 20 and two, like 20 and 14, Dwight. Yeah. With two blocks. This one might be S. I might put this one S. Worst S- case, if we see another one that's S and there's too many up there, we'll put them back down. But this okay. one might be up there. We can throw that S for now. We can throw that S for now. Because Orlando Dwight was a different monster. Oh, different was, monster. Oh. I never – when Quentin Quinn Richardson was talking about playing with him, he said he, like, had to relearn how to play defense. Because he used to, like, somebody get past him and get to the rim, you give somebody a hard foul. And he said there was too many times where he would do that, and Dwight would end up punching the shot, and it was obviously still called a foul. And Dwight mm-hmm. would get mad at him, like, bro, stop doing that. Like, I'm there. I'm always <laughs> going to be there. Like, <laughs> you need to trust me. That's crazy. <laughs> um, going to jump forward a couple of more years here to the second LeBron James um, MVP here on the lit or MVP runner up. So this is James Harden's MVP year. Um, so this is 2017, 2018. So we know about 2018 LeBron, and mm-hmm. <laughs> what that is is one of the best versions of LeBron. So this year, James Harden won MVP. He put up 30 points, nine assists, almost two steals with five rebounds as well. Um, and Houston won 65 games. Um, but LeBron put up 27.5 points. rebounds, nine assists, a block, and a steal and a half. And Cleveland won 50 games and probably did not deserve to win 50 games with that team. And then went to the NBA Finals, which I know is not really a part of this, but like 
LeBron was really backpacking this team. Crazy. Uh, yeah. So where would you put this runner-up season? See, this one, you had to be there. You, this one, you had to be there to watch this one to really understand why this one was crazy. Because, like you said, backpacking this team. This was the year where they, like, revamped the whole roster at the deadline, got a whole brand-new roster. Bron led the league in minutes, played, and played all 82 games. Like, that, yeah. that's what, you know, you had to really be there to understand, like, the context behind this one. So if, if I put... Mm, if I put Dwight at S, I might put him at S for now. I might okay. have to do it just because I feel, the fact I feel that like he this, is, him. this version of LeBron has to be S tier. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't forget. I don't even care about the the individual stats for a second. They won fifty game. Let me put this roster up, bro. They shouldn't have won fifty games at all. Like that's the one with like George Hill. They Shetty got the old Osmond, days. Larry Nance. Kevin Love, uh, Jr. You, Isaiah the Thomas, Wade, right? Like this roster had no business doing <laughs> anything, <laughs> let alone go to the NBA Finals. Right. Yeah, LeBron was in a different bag. Um, got a couple more here. The next one is the following season. So Harden won in twenty eighteen. He was the runner-up in 2019, putting up 36 points yeah, per great. game with seven and a <laughs> half assists, two steals, and 6.6 rebounds. The Rockets ended up with 53 wins um, and ended up losing to the Golden State Warriors in the second round. The MVP this year was Giannis. This was his uh, first MVP, um, 27 points, 12 and a half rebounds, six assists. Basically, uh, a steal and a half and a block and a half a game. And the Bucks were a 60 win team um, that year. So, 36 points a night, James Harden. This was the year he went on that crazy, ridiculous streak. I think he had Matter like. Fact, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was saying, that was the year he had, what was it like? He went like a calendar month without going under 30 points a game. Yeah. Nah, with the context, this is S. This is easy S for me. I think this is yeah. easy S. This might be one or two in terms of like th- bro, 36 <laughs> points per game and not winning the MVP is crazy. Bro, this that's to say I'm not saying it's undeserved. Obviously, Giannis mm-hmm. deserved MVP, but it's just that's crazy. This this Harden right here is the reason why these Harden stands on Twitter is comparing him to D Wade. <laughs> that, that Harden. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, if you just watch this Harden. I'd see what they're talking about, but mm-hmm. nah, having 36 points a game, that's easy S, bro. He was hooping, bro. Absolutely yeah. carrying. The last two we got here are going to be the inverse of each other. So the 2022 MVP was Jokic. That was his back second of a back-to-back MVP run. The runner-up that year was Joel Embiid. Jokic averaged 27 points, 14 assists, 14 rebounds, 8 assists, a steal and a half and a block a game. Joel Embiid put up 30.6 points per game, almost 12 rebounds, four assists, a steal and a block and a half per game. Philly won 51 games that year. The Nuggets won 48. So he also has the edge on Jokic in terms of team success by a slight margin. Um, This was like, Closer than the year prior, because this was the second year in a row that Embiid had come second to Jokic in MVP voting. And this one was very closely contested. Um, this is the one he should have won. That he, If he didn't get hurt, he would have won, right? Like, remember, he got hurt later in the season. And then, um, like, so I swear he was, like, leading it. And then he got hurt. And then he, that, he played 68 games. Jokic played 74. So I would check out. Yeah, because I swear the narrative around it was, all right, this is Joel's MVP. Then he got hurt. And then now that's when he won the MVP. Everyone was like, all right, he finally gets the one that he deserves. Yeah. So He he was the first center to put up 30 points a game in a long time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. See, this one, I don't want to put everybody in S. I really don't. I don't mm-hmm. know. This one don't got no, like, I feel like Bron carrying him, like, has some, like, held a lot of weight to it, hard in yeah. 36 points. Like, I'm put this one A. I'll put this one at A. I don't want to put no one like this. Uh, to me, I feel like this is A. 
I don't care who put this Jason Kill one at suit. Yeah, I'm like, not gonna no, lie. <laughs> I was about to say, now that like I realized the level of all these other guys, right. you can put Jason Kidd down. Bro, because as much as we just was talking about Steve Nash didn't this <laughs> didn't deserve yeah. his MVPs, <laughs> that's like the same stat line, oh, bro. Yeah, yeah. you can put uh, Jason Kidd down. Sure. Yeah. Um, and we can address the S tier as we go to the next one. So now we're gonna go to the M versus past season. Embiid got his MVP. He put up 33 points a night, 10 rebounds, four assists with a steal and 1.7 blocks. Jokic comes in second, putting up 24 and a half points a game, almost 12 rebounds, 9.8 assists, so almost a double double with assists, 1.3 steals a game, and 0.7 blocks. Um, we saw what happened in the playoffs to both Embiid and Jokic. Obviously, Embiid bows out before the conference finals, and Jokic goes and gets his championship and a finals MVP. But where does that regular season stack up in terms of MVP runners up on this list? Ah, this one is tough, man. This one is tough. This one is teetering A and S for me. Because, like, bro, he almost had a triple double. Like, he plays one more game, he gets 10 assists, he has a triple double. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, Mm, the efficiency is crazy too. He shot like sixty percent from the field. Yep, like thirty eight percent from three. Yep, sixty three percent from the field. Switch, put this S and put Dwight down to A. Okay, I think I think we could do that because like the the that top tier right there is like best of the best of the best. Like right. Dwight was like very close, but I don't think he was on that level. So like I want to yeah. put Jokic there, but I don't want too many people on S. Yeah. I think this is I think this is a good list. I think this is right. Both these LeBron years are crazy. Mm-hmm. 36 a night for a season is crazy. Insane. And then Jokic almost averaged a triple double as a center. With that and that crazy efficiency, like, yeah, no, nah, that has to be S. That has yeah. to be up there, bro. And after I know we can't account for what like take into account what he did after that, but I'm sorry, bro. To go on that crazy run, that's definitely S. Yeah, this was fun though. This was, it was fun putting the tier list together and look through all of the stats because, like I said, the ones you hear about the most are like Steve Nash's MVPs, or honestly, more recently, I've been hearing a lot more people not feeling Derrick Rose's MVP and feeling like that was a little I've undeserved too. I see um, a little bit. So it's, it's interesting to really like re dive into these races again. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this happened when we were, especially the some of the first ones that we like covered, like these happened when we were kids, so like really diving into it again. Um, and looking at it through a new lens is interesting, but it's but tough yeah. though. It's tough because like you can't. A lot of these though, you can't just look at stats and uh, like uh, some of these you really had to be there. Like Derrick Rose's MVP. Right. Like, if you go back and look at the stats, like compare it to like point guards now, like what was it like twenty four points or something like that? Like it was the stats wasn't crazy, but like if you were in the moment, I feel like he deserved the MVP. Like yeah. you just have to certain certain one certain seasons you have to just be in the moment to understand why they got that and understand the context behind it. It's always going to be a narrative behind every single MVP race period that like that will never live in the stat sheet or the box score or like in right. stats in general. Um, it's like that's even a big reason why this whole Jokic being a runner up is such a big thing is because like you said, bro, average almost a triple double as a center with crazy efficiency and he got this MVP would have been one of a very small group of players to go back to back to back with MVPs. Right. It's a lot of narratives that go into it. It's so crazy. Right. And even these, like, like I said, there could have been a couple more LeBron years because there were multiple other years where he came second to MVP voting. Like some of that came down to voter fatigue too. people like, which was kind of got chalked up to like, Mm Mm-hmm. So it's it's crazy. A lot of it does get narrative based, and I mean, like it or not, like there was a lot of narratives being thrown around this past year when it came time for MVP voting between Embiid or Jokic, and really made it a two man race, even when Giannis was right there with them. But bro, Giannis can have this. Brown has been having the same stat line for the past like three years, bro. Same stat right. line as the MVP seasons, but because they won it already, nah, we didn't give it to him. Right. Ah, uh, this was fun. This was fun. We gotta do yeah. something, something more like this more often. Um, but with that though, that is gonna do it for episode twenty-five of the Off the Glass podcast. 
On the next episode, we're going to be wrapping up our player rankings and be doing the top 10 centers. And then, honestly, we'll probably have a couple of NFL-only episodes as we really get through the thick of preseason and get ready for the start of the regular season. Um, We'll still dabble with the basketball, and then especially as that starts to ramp up um, in September and we get into the basketball preseason, we'll probably get into a nice mix between the two of them. Maybe we'll split it, one basketball, one football. We'll kind of fill that out as it goes. But we appreciate you for listening. As always, again, if you're on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Follow the socials on screen below. If you're on audio platforms, go ahead and leave a five-star rating and review and pre-download the show. It helps us out a ton. As always, I'm Billy. I'm Dane. Or <laughs> I'm Billy. Mm-hmm. He's Dane. That's why we can't do these podcasts at night, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we out. Peace. <clears throat> yes, sir.